this morning's session. Uh, I think a couple of members are just making their way into the room. Um, so we, we do have a quorum. Um, all members are here in person, with the exception of Dolores Kelly, who's joining, joining us by Starleaf. So today, um, just being, be sure that you maintain your social distancing throughout the meeting. Um, today's business, we will consider some subordinate legislation, a briefing from the utility regulator, and a briefing from the Transport Regulation Unit. Um, we have no apologies as we have full attendance. Uh, I have no business as, as chair. Moving then to item three, which the draft minutes at page six. They're the minutes of the 14th of October. Are members content? Great. Okay, moving then to <coughs> matters arising at page 12. Again, that's for the, the meeting of the 14th of October. Members have any issues which they would like to raise as a consequence of that? At page 16, at page 15, apologies, you'll find the outstanding committee requests for information. Um, moving then to correspondence at um, item 5, and just draw your attention to the memo at page 21 and also table papers at page 3. At page 159 we have a response from the minister um, to our correspondence um, regarding issues from the committee um, meeting on the 30th of September. Do members have any um, thoughts in relation to that or any comments? No content? Okay. We also have uh, page 163 with correspondence from... Um, Apologies, sorry? 163, 163, yeah, with correspondence from the Council, um, from Derry City and Straban District Council, and that's an offer for us to use the Guildhall for a committee meeting and also request to, to brief the committee. And I would like to be in a position where we can take up that offer, but unfortunately, but just where we are at the moment, but certainly um, when, um, I suppose, restrictions are, are lifted, that we will try to make our way to, to the northwest. I think it would be important to, to do that. Um, at page 22, we have um, the departmental response uh, regarding the impact of COVID mitigation measures on DVA, and that's obviously due to the four-week um, restriction period, which has now been put in place, which, of course, that was mentioned throughout question time yesterday with the minister and the implications that is obviously going to have on... Um, driving instructors um, and, and those taking their tests. So members, any comments to make with regards to that? Okay. Um, there was obviously an issue in relation to, the, the minister had mentioned um, how um, staff were going to be reallocated because there were those who had a dual role who were going to be moving over from MOT testing to um, to being driving, full-time driving, driving, exam driving test examiners. Um, so it would be interesting maybe just to get some information as to whether that's going to have a direct impact on MOTs and allow for more MOTs then to be to be um, um, yeah. processed during that period of time. Um, because I know that they were in a, the process of obviously recruiting additional staff to, to test vehicles too. So maybe that might ease that pressure. Okay, members, anything else they wish to um, note from the correspondence? Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Just to note, I received a piece of correspondence which was um, an allegation of, in terms of declaration of a conflict of interest. I don't know whether the uh, committee clerks received that as well, just to confirm that it has been received. Yes, yeah, certainly that was circulated to everyone um, yesterday morning, and I know that the the, um, the committee office had received that maybe in, the, in advance of that. Um, Alison, maybe you want to. Maybe explain what it was that you've done, or what the yeah, office it's, done. it came in about an hour or two before um, it was circulated to everybody. Um, and what happened was, uh, Kathy took it up to our clerk assistant um, to get advice on that, um, and also uh, sought advice from a number of other places as well. And it was very clear that the you know the complainant needs to go through the correct. Uh, process and make the complaint in the correct way um, and neither of the two issues that were raised were matters for the committee to cover um, so the uh, complainant was directed to the routes that they should follow 
um, and it was after that that it was circulated to all the members. So they have been advised how to make a complaint about a minister um, and how to raise other issues about officials, but none of them fall within the committee's remit. Thank you. Okay. Do, Thank just you on that, I mean, um, obviously it's clearly what you're saying. It's not an issue for the committee itself. I mean, it goes to some other office, be it the commissioner or whoever, yeah? Mm -hmm. Is that what we're clarifying? Yeah, that's basically what's happening. Okay. Ms. Anderson? On a different matter? Okay. Um, just that it was, array, it was mentioned yesterday by the minister because you had spoken about the, um, the responses that we had in the chamber uh, yesterday with regards to the Financial Assistance Act, which has been in place from 2009, which allows her to put a scheme in place for, for taxi drivers and coach drivers and hauliers. So, given that the minister had said that uh, they had to collect the evidence, obviously this is part of triggering that. We knew that that needed to be triggered, so you had to produce the exceptional uh, circumstances, and of course we all know there, there are many. Uh, could we find out where that's at from the minister? Because we've been mentioning it almost weekly in the committee and otherwise, and it would be good to find out from the minister where they are at with collating the information to demonstrate the exceptional circumstances and the scheme being put in place. Okay, anyone else? Any in? No? Okay, yep, I'm content to do that. I understand um, from various conversations that that's in, that's in track and that there is information maybe going to EEO in relation to um, the process because obviously the case has to be made for exceptional circumstances and then as a consequence of that then obviously I think I mean, she may have mentioned this actually in the chamber yesterday that officials then were working up a scheme so um, perhaps just to get if some clarification around that would be yeah. Yeah. because the industry needs to know. Okay. Any other members? Anything at this stage? No? Okay. Um, members content with the suggested um, means of dealing with correspondence as detailed in the memo? Okay. Thank you. Moving then to item six, which is um, SL1, the regulation EC. I'm sorry? What page, yeah? It's at page 165. So it's regulation EC number. Um, 1370 um, 2007 Public Service Obligation in Transport Amendment EU Exit Northern Ireland Regulations 2020. This rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. This SL1 was initially considered at the committee meeting on the 23rd of September and members requested um, some additional information around two of the regulations yeah. and the departmental responses at page 168. The purpose of the proposed regulation is to remove references to Member States, EU law, the requirement to report to the European Commission, as well as replacement references to EU directives and regulations with their appropriate UK replacements. These amendments will ensure the retained EC regulation will operate effectively following the completion of the withdrawal implementation period. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Uh, yeah, Chair, mm -hmm. it was myself who, who interrogated this, and I can see I'm sorry, from... Um, I can't really hear you very well. Okay, okay. Sorry. sorry, will I turn this? Is this better? Um, okay. Um, it was myself who had asked for this to be uh, to be checked out, and I can see from the, the Reg 3, Regulation 3, that the purpose of the amendment seeks to ensure that domestic... Uh, status mirrors EU law and public service obligations in transport, and that's what I wanted to be satisfied about. So, yeah, okay. sure. yeah just then following on from I, I do agree with that, but there's a bigger issue in terms of while it's transferred over, it's it's what the powers then do. From We understand that that's needed to transfer back to the board, but I'm still concerned about the whole Brexit and the whole, so we need to keep that on board as well. You know what I mean? Whilst this here is giving the power back to the department, clearly that's what's staying. It's, Whatever, whatever rolls out from the EU after that in terms of what we do, in terms of the whole legislative process, in terms of regulations, in terms of directives, there's a bigger issue than just yeah, well, what I'm content with this SL. Well, that's obviously, uh, that's obviously yeah. in motion. Um, Absolutely. Okay, moving then to items. Everyone else content with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> moving then to item seven, which is SR um, 2020 200. 218, which is the Planning Act 2011 Review Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and that's at page 171. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 16th of September 2020, and we were content at that stage. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. 
and we obviously spent quite a bit of time actually um, discussing this with officials. So are members content with this rule? Yeah. Yep. Okay, thank you. So just to read the motion that the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020 218, the Planning Act 2011, Review Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Great. Great. Moving then to item seven, or sorry, item eight, which is at page 179 of SR um, 2020 222 which is the carriage of dangerous goods and use of transportable pressure equipment amendment regulations Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 16th of September 2020 and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Thank you. So that the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-222, the carriage of dangerous goods and use of transportable pressure equipment amendment regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory, statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Great. Okay, thank you. Moving then to item five, and we have a, a briefing from the Office of the Utility Regulator, um, and at page... 188 you have a powerpoint presentation and at page 199 we have the northern ireland utility regulator 2019 to 20 annual report and accounts just to remind members that um, hansard will record the meeting and we're going to welcome to our meeting um, tanya headley who is director of compliance and network operations um, the, from the utility regulator northern ireland and Mr. John Mills, who is Head of Network Price Regulation, again, <coughs> from the Utility Regulator in Northern Ireland. Um, you're both very welcome um, to our meeting this morning. Um, thank you for joining us. And if you would like to um, make your presentation, and then members will follow up with some questions. <coughs> OK, thank you very much for this opportunity to present to you both on um, PC21, the biggest price control our organisation has ever done, and also any other um, infrastructure related issues that you may have um, interest in, we'll happily answer what questions we can on those while we're here. Um, PC, I'm going to start covering the first few slides and then I'm going to hand over to John to go into some of the, the detail. Uh, my title is slightly changed, I'm now Director of Networks, so I'm now responsible for regulating electricity and water gas in Northern Ireland, um, all of the network companies um, engaged on those activities. Um, out of all of those <coughs> companies, uh, PC21 is the largest price control my organisation has ever completed. It covers six years and is a total of £1.68 billion pounds of investment. This is a, a very large amount of money, but this money is desperately needed. Um, I'm sure you're aware there are a number of constraints on Northern Ireland Waters Network due to past underinvestment. This level of investment, £1.68 billion, will not address all of those constraints. Um, we asked the company to um, assess what was deliverable within this price control period and not make unrealistic assumptions about its ability for the six years. So this is what Northern Ireland Water believes it can achieve and what we believe that it can achieve if it is fully funded. It is important to us that Northern Ireland Water has security of funding and it would also be very valuable for their delivery if they had confidence in a three-year capital budget, and that is something that is common elsewhere within the UK. Um, in fact, it's GB accepted practice, and even in these very times of great time of great uncertainty in the UK, it has been accepted that for infrastructure, three-year confidence in three-year capital funding adds significant value to ensure it was delivered efficiently. So I'm going to move on to my second slide about who we are. Um, uh, we are an independent non-ministerial department. We are set up through legislation. Our duties are given to us by the Assembly. And we cover electricity, water and gas. We um, would use competition where appropriate as regulate, to regulate. And there is competition in retail markets in Northern Ireland. 
and in the wholesale market on the um, all island. Um, my specific duties relate to the network companies, and I am responsible for protecting the interests of electricity consumers, as well as promoting gas and protecting the interests of water and sewerage customers. If I move on to my third slide, just to say a little bit about why regulation was put in place in originally. Um, these are services that we rely on that are essential for consumers, and we expect them to be of high quality and, of value, uh, and provide good value for money. And economic theory would say a uh, competitive um, uh, market would provide that. But these are services these network provides where it wouldn't make sense to have more than one network. There is no competition, so therefore it's important that these charges are appropriate. And that's our job as regulators, to ensure these costs are appropriate. For companies um, that uh, borrow from um, uh, in stock markets, raise debt, uh, having a regulator independent from government means that they have greater certainty and they can borrow money at a lower level, bringing costs down for consumers. So, if I move on to the responsibilities that government has given us, um, we have we issue and monitor licences, and those licences that we companies we regulate are defined in law. We set standards of service. We aim to keep bills as low as possible, but we do take account of both consumers who pay now and what consumers will pay in the future. We rule on complaints and appeals, and it's worth saying that the, my organisation has returned nearly one point, uh, actually over 1.5 million, 1.57 million, from um, regulated companies that have not met the standards we would expect. And out of that money, we have insured £845,000 was returned to charities in Northern Ireland. And those are charities that obviously are involved in areas that consumers who were, we felt, uh, received harm through this, these companies not meeting that service. They, they, they benefited from that. It is important for us to also ensure investment and innovation takes place, because we are looking to the future and the long-term stability of these companies. And we also want to promote choice where appropriate, and that is why we have a retail market both in gas and electricity, and uh, people have the ability to switch their electricity supplier. If I move on to the Northern Ireland water slide about our role there. As I have identified, we regulate as per the legislation, and it is important that we do talk to other stakeholders and ensure that we are meeting their needs. Northern Ireland Water has the enviable position of having three regulators. It has the Drink Drinking Water Inspectorate, it has the uh, Environmental uh, Agency, and we also engage very closely with CCNI, uh, the Consumer Representation Body. Uh, the department, uh, who both are the shareholder and the policy, uh, the body that sets policy for Northern Ireland Water, is DFI, and obviously it's very important we engage closely with them. One of the things we take account of when we're looking at the price controls is the social and environmental guidance which the department set, and that gives us clear guidance as to the policy and what is required for Northern Ireland Water from this price control period. So that was taken into account. I want to, before I hand over to John, just talk a little bit more about the um, consumer side, because our main duty is to protect consumers, and that is a very important focus for us. It is important that the consumer is in the room as we think about some of the decisions that we are making, and that we are very much ensuring we are delivering for the people who are receiving this service. And It is worth noting that um, commercial businesses in Northern Ireland pay water, pay for their water and sewerage services, and they want to have comfort they are going to receive the service that they are paying for, and that their bills are appropriate, and the quality is there in terms of the service they expect. There, will be, there is ongoing change. We are very focused on the fact that um, consumers in our society's needs are changing. Um, we have a programme looking at consumer uh, best practice going forward, and we are focused on vulnerability. And the level of vulnerability is increasing in Northern Ireland in these uncertain times. And it is important that Northern Ireland Water, when it is serving these customers, takes account of their specific needs. It is not a blanket service, uh, fit one uh, box fits all. Uh, they need to be, take account of, of individual needs. 
So we will be looking for them to build on the consumer engagement and the consumer service they currently provide and improve that through this price control period. We also are looking for them to continue to improve uh, their level of efficiency and the costs and also deliver things like the Living with Water programme, which I am sure you are aware of, which addresses specific issues associated with Belfast. We will monitor Northern Land Water through this price control period, as we have through past price control periods, and we produce an annual cost and performance report looking each year at how they perform, and that is something the committee might be interested in in the future. So uh, that is my high level piece in relation to regulation <coughs> and this price control, and I am now going to ask John to go into a little more detail on the actual document we have just published. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. So I want to continue with a short presentation of some of the key points from the PC21 draft determination, which we published at the end of September. The determination provides us with an assessment of what Northern Ireland Water can deliver over a six-year period from 2021 to 2027, and at what cost. I'll start with the um, man from the consumer perspective and then just move on to look at uh, information on operational expenditure and capital expenditure. Then I want to just speak a little bit about the impact on overall revenue and on bills for those consumers who do pay in the commercial sector. And finally, I just want to recap and highlight some of the key benefits that the plan will deliver. So I want to begin uh, the, with the perspective of the consumer. Price control is underpinned by consumer engagement, which was developed in conjunction with the Consumer Council, the Department and Northern Ireland Water. It included consumer research by Ipsos Mori, focused on deliberative research, which is really a structured conversation with consumers rather than trying to measure numbers. And it's also underpinned by ongoing work that we do with the company through a consumer measures and satisfaction working group. The key outcome of that work is that we are moving away from sort of the more traditional output measures that we have had for the company, which are based on things like level of service, such as water pressure, supply interruption and flooding risk, towards measures which are based really on the consumer experience and consumer satisfaction, such as unwanted contacts, first point of contact resolution and net promoter score. Now, we have continued to set targets for level of service and for the delivery of outputs, such as upgrades of treatment works and activities, such as the replacement of water mains. But the new measures that we are promoting through this price control are intended to drive sort of continuous incremental improvement in customer service, which is based rather on sort of large surveys of consumers, but instead on actionable data, which comes from Northern Ireland Water's day-to-day -day interaction with their consumers. And the final point I want to make on the consumer perspective, and just reiterate something that Tanya has said, is our work in vulnerable consumers. And it's a key aspect of our ongoing consumer protection programme. And we will begin to develop relevant targets for Northern Ireland Water in this respect as the work comes to a conclusion. So the next thing I just wanted to turn to was operational expenditure. And we've Giving you a slide which shows the profile of operational expenditure back to 2007 and then taken forward into PC21. And it can be used really to emphasise a, a number of points. And firstly, is the reduction in Northern Iron Water's operational expenditure since our first price control in 2010. The company has continued to deliver improved efficiency over that period and has caught up a large part of the gap relative to comparative companies in GB. And in PC21, we expect the company to continue to enclose an efficiency gap, which we estimate is 8 per cent of cost relative to upper quartile companies in GB, and also then to deliver an ongoing level of efficiency improvement as well. And that's equivalent, really, of 2.1 per cent improvement per annum. And it will deliver around £73 million pounds worth of savings relative to the company's plan. The next thing I want to touch on was capital investment and efficiency. 
First thing point I'd like to make is, again, we've challenged the company on the efficiency of delivery, and we've concluded that it can deliver the planned investment for $1.68 billion, which is 12 per cent lower than the company proposed. Maybe before just unpacking some of those numbers a little bit more, um, it's worth drawing your attention to the fact that around 40 per cent of this investment, $680 million over six years, is described as capital maintenance. Northern Ireland Water run and operate a huge <coughs> asset base, and this really is simply the money that is required to keep the existing assets <coughs> ticking over and to maintain the existing level of service. Then starting to look at how we are planning to improve. A key part of the price control is the social and environmental guidance that we receive from the Department. It sets the context within which we work. And I want to just pick up a couple of quotes on that which are relevant to the issue of development. The first is it recognises that Northern Ireland Water has been unable to invest adequately in future sustainability of water and sewerage services. And the continued underinvestment would fail to meet the needs of citizens, the economy and society as a whole. So it's emphasising that there's, this is not just about drainage, it actually has a, a real life impact on the economy. And it asks that Northern Ireland Water formulate a, a deliverable investment plan which meets established needs and is affordable for a tariff perspective. So essentially, this plan has been developed with a view of not increasing prices. Northern Ireland Water has put forward a plan which begins to develop, uh, address development constraints by improving the capacity of the sewerage and wastewater treatment. While this is the main reason for the stepped increase of investment that you'll see in the plan, there's also increased investment in water treatment works to secure and improve water quality, and also actually in water trunk mains, um, which improve the resilience of water supplies, particularly in rural areas, and is really a response to some of the things that we saw in the industrial action back in 2015, some of the issues which arose there. When we're looking at a stepped increase in investment, we've also considered the issue of deliverability of the plan. And the first part of that is really is securing the necessary funding, and the second is the pace at which it can be delivered. So time will be required to complete some of the investigations and designs and procure and deliver the works. We have challenged the rate of increase in investment in our draft determination, particularly the stepped increase in the first year and there will be further discussions with the company on that. I think the, the point I'd emphasise here is that the ability to deliver is conditional on having the confidence in the budget. The company needs to commit resources to develop its plan um, into a detailed procurement, and the supply chain needs confidence that work will go ahead to gear up and then deliver efficiently. And I suppose I'd again just reiterate the point that Tanya was making about our we think that medium-term budgets are an essential part of this package, rather than the year-on-year -year budgeting that the company faces at the moment. Difficult to deliver a major capital program within that. Then I want to say a little bit about development constraints, which really are a key driver for the, the budget in this. You'll understand that the lack of capacity in networks causes unsatisfactory overflows to occur and leaves us with treatment works that don't comply with the statutory consents which the Environment Agency issued. It impacts on the planned development of housing and industry, which really underpin the well-being of the economy and ultimately the well-being of society. Northern Ireland Waters plans in PC21 will only begin to address the current development strains, and further investment will be required in future price controls. And indeed, the, the need to plan, and procure and deliver some fairly substantial pieces of investment means that some of this will not occur towards the end of this six-year period. So that's going to present a wider challenge to all of us as to how economic development can be supported while that necessary investment is delivered. And I think the final thing I just want to note in terms of capital investment is the figures we've quoted, the $1.68 billion, are in 1819 prices. Um, at other times, colleagues will speak to you in terms of 
prices, including inflation, particularly when they talk about uh, the need for public expenditure capital Dell. And the equivalent figure of our 1.68 billion in uh, public expenditure capital to term, Dell terms is around 1.95 billion, and that's the impact of inflation. I then want to turn to the slide that we provided on revenue and bills. One of the key things we've seen in the economy in recent years has been lower levels of interest. We were able to reflect this in our decisions and price controls and the cost of capital which is necessary to finance the investment. The rate that we have proposed of 1.7% is probably the lowest that has been proposed by regulators to date. The advantage of this is it allows us to increase investment without placing an increasing pressure on prices. However, we also need to recognise that increased investment, which is expected to continue over this and probably the next price control at least, increases the amount of money we are borrowing and financing. And that obviously then starts to put a pressure, an upward pressure on prices. What we have done in the round on this price control, we have concluded that the, the right thing to do is to maintain prices in real terms. And that means they will increase by RPI over the period of the price control. We have done this to ensure that today's consumers pay a fair price for the service that they receive, and also that we control the increase in debt and charges for future consumers. So essentially, we are levelling out tariffs over the longer term. In technical terms, we will talk about a weighted average charge increase of zero and price limits of zero. But in practical terms, this results in reductions in prices for some categories of consumers and increases for others, depending on past movements in prices and changes in the volume of water consumed. And on the slide, we've given you an indication of the movements for different categories of consumers. I think finally, just to recap on PC21 on the last slide and key outputs and benefits. Investment in the capacity of the surge in wastewater treatment to deliver for the environment and to address development constraints will require a commitment to increase capital investment. Lower costs of financing will mitigate the impact this has on bills for non-domestic customers. And we have proposed zero price limits in real terms to protect the interests of consumers into the future. We have continued to challenge Northern Ireland water and cost efficiency, but I think it's worth us reiterating the success of the company in closing the efficiency gap over time. And while we continue to use historical outputs, um, BC21 includes a new direction in terms of consumer measures which we believe should underpin continuous incremental improvement in service. And with that, I'll hand back to Tanya. So I hope you have found this short presentation uh, of what is a very substantial document. I don't know if uh, you've seen uh, how much work has gone into it. I hope it's been helpful. I want to flag that we have not provided any extra money uh, in relation to Brexit. Um, though we have sought assurances from Northern Ireland Water, which they have provided to ourselves and other regulators and the department, that the risks associated with that are managed. We also haven't considered if there's any additional costs because of the COVID uh, uh, epidemic. The submission for the business case was pre-COVID, and further consideration may need to be given uh, as that works its way through in terms of Northern Ireland Water's processes. Um, I hope that the main message I, I, I really want to land with you is that it's important that Northern Ireland Water is funded to deliver this essential service for consumers, and um, we would uh, ask you to give consideration to ensure there is security of funding going forward. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you, thank you for that presentation. Actually, two of the questions I was going to ask was in relation to Brexit and COVID, and that's obviously been addressed. And I'm mindful that um, all members actually have indicated to ask questions, so I'll try to be brief. Um, one of the main issues around all of this is deliverability, and, and you've highlighted that particularly well. And obviously, that's in relation to securing the funding and also the pace of delivery. Um, you mentioned the discussions that you had with the company. What discussions have you had directly with the Department of Finance um, and obviously the Minister for Infrastructure? 
Well, I haven't personally met the Minister for Infrastructure. You may be aware we are uh, sort of um, Jenny Piper is our CEO and she uh, ends <laughs> uh, in a, a week's time and John French will be um, taking up the role on the 2nd of November. Otherwise, uh, we would have the CEO present for this, uh, this, this uh, presentation. But um, we have very good governance structures that um, really uh, I, I consider world leading in terms of how we engage with key stakeholders with uh, an op output group which meet to talk about what we need and what needs to be delivered with um, both the uh, water quality, um, drinking water inspectorate there and the environmental agency and CCNI as well as the department. So therefore we are all very much aware of what is important to the, the different groups and, and come together with an understanding of what is required from Northern Ireland Water to ensure that it meets all its legal obligations. And, and the department is, I say, in the room for those discussions as well and is very aware of, of, of what everybody's position is as we go forward. Um, that's been something that we've worked very closely with them throughout all the price control periods. This, price, this um, stakeholder engagement structure was put in place very early on and uh, as I say, it's worked very well for us. Okay, so, but the challenge specifically is in relation or is in relation to deliverability, and obviously that's predicated on on funding being being available. And you, and you talked about having a, a medium term budget, and obviously the three year capital budget, which would be incredibly helpful for for the company. Um, obviously, that lies specifically with um, the um, Department of Finance um, and public executive, I suppose, collectively. It's really discussions in relation to finance. I suppose I'd be quite interested in if, if you've had um, anything specific around um, we, we, budgets. We, 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 we have specifically engaged on budgets uh, through every price control period. I personally would, would be talking um, to the uh, Perm Secretary and, and dep uh, deputies about this because it's such a key issue for us. We're very much aware the Living With Water programme is also within this, this money and there's been engagement. We're part of the Living With Water programme board and are engaged there as well. I'm also on the Belfast City Council Sustainability and Resilience Board because they have obviously an interest in the, the water infrastructure they have within Belfast and the particular constraints that are there. So yes, this is something that um, obviously I'm emphasising it here and we would continue to engage with anyone who we can get to listen mm -hmm. uh, about the importance of funding this. Water is a food stuff. It's, you know, it falls from the, 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 the skies. But when it's coming from a tap, the quality has to be of that standard. Northern Ireland Water is the biggest user of electricity in Northern Ireland as well. They have bills to pay. And on top of that, we want them to develop further infrastructure to allow further economic development in Northern Ireland. They have to be given the money to actually to build what is required. Okay, and, and, and despite those challenges, um, we did mention that um, the 1.68 billion was 12% lower than the company itself had proposed. Yeah. Yes. And that, that comes, if, if you want me to sort of touch on how we do that, that comes partly from um, challenging it using benchmarking against GB companies. I mentioned the sort of 680 million that's spent on capital maintenance. We derive that challenge through benchmarking. We also then uh, use a reporter who looks at the company's plan and has challenged some of the costings that the company has put forward, particularly around the additions for risk. Um, within the plan. And the final thing we do ourselves is we look at the plan in detail, building on the, the information that we have of historic costs of the company um, and then challenge the company against those historic costs. And some of those areas where we challenge against historic costs are simpler than others. So where we know, for example, the rate the company has spent on replacing water mains, we would expect it to carry forward into the future. It does become more complex when we're looking at things like sewage treatment works, which are really bottom-up estimates. Okay, um, and I, I try, I'm not going to get you involved in a political argument, but has uh, have you considered um, the various models or different models um, of funding for Northern Ireland Water, which may assist them throughout? This is not our role. Our role is very clear uh, and identified in statute. Um, our position is we want to see security of funding. The model is a matter for uh, government policy. Um, the comment that you made in relation to the, de de um, the constraints on development is, is probably is quite worrying in the fact that um, we have over 100 um, towns and villages now that there are constraints on, and obviously the issue around um, as we're moving 
um, through COVID and hopefully then out of COVID, obviously, um, regeneration is going to be, um, be vital for the economy. Uh, and to hear that it could be towards the end of the six-year period before um, some of this development will be addressed and perhaps then moving into the next price control period is of concern. And I'd agree, and that, that's why we're highlighting it. Um, as was said in the quote from the Social Environmental Guidance, there has been an issue of constrained funding for a number of years. So we really are trying to play catch-up now if the budget is available. But even at a practical level, it does mean that those development constraints won't be relieved towards sort of the second half of the price control and towards the end of it. And we also made the point that this price control won't relieve all development constraints. And that really was the purpose of my comment, that we, we all have an interest in working out what we do in the meantime um, while those constraints exist. They're, they're, they won't be removed for some time. Okay. And my final question is just in relation to the final slide that you had around improved efficiency, where you say that by the end of price control, Northern Ireland Water will operate at comparable levels of efficiency to similar companies in England and Wales today. Um, how much behind those companies are we talking? I mean, is this considerable or is it manageable, that the issues around efficiency? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd quoted uh, an efficiency again. Sort of Sorry about the, the complexity I throw into this sometimes, but an 8% uh, gap with the upper quartile companies in GB. So they are behind, but not very behind. And I, I did in my final comments say we need to recognise the improvements that have been made by the company since 2010 in improving its efficiency. They are significant. Okay. Thank you. Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm sure I'm worried that after the training session this morning, I'm worried that all our members want to ask questions, so we'll try and be precise. J just in terms of you, the, your office this year, I mean, how has COVID affected utility regulator and the operations of this year in well, particular? We're quite lucky. The nature of our work involves a lot of sitting in front of spreadsheets and writing documents, which is something that's very easily managed from a home working environment. We've actually been the majority of the staff are working out of the office and will continue to work out of the office. But uh, in some areas, productivity is increased because obviously if you're sitting and there's just you and a computer and work and you're, you know, you, you're not disturbed by people chit-chatting around you, the areas that I suppose where we would have uh, more difficulty is this sort of engagement with stakeholders because a key aspect of our job is talking to our stakeholders and ensuring that uh, we understand what their expectations are and what they need, their needs are from the regulated companies. But uh, I've spent a lot of time on Zoom and I'm getting much more proficient at it. Uh, there's a bit of a benevolent dictator in some of the meetings, but uh, we, we, we're, 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 I would say we are continuing to be effective and continue to provide the protections that consumers both expect and need from us. Okay. And in terms of your annual budget, has it, where are we at with it? Has it changed over the years or where, can you comment on it? There were increases because of a huge step change in work relating to the uh, ISEM project, which is now um, uh, incorporated into the wholesale market. And that was a requirement of European legislation that we made significant changes. So there was no option that programme had to go ahead. And it was a very significant piece of work because uh, we were redesigning the entire electricity market to meet European compliance requirements. And it's now up and going and, and uh, delivering for consumers. OK. And just uh, two more quick questions, Chair. Uh, on your annual report on the Council, I just want to get the page here, please. I may, um, it says in, in terms of the, the responsibilities to page 211. In doing so, the utility regulators shall have regard to, among other things, the interests of a number of individuals. And one of those are people in rural areas. Mm -hmm. And I just, because John, I know you had mentioned there about yeah. terminology like new direction. In terms of the PC21, I mean, I know one in particular border areas, but generally in rural areas, there's a number of areas that don't ha even have a water main. Uh, coming up some of the roads, you know, they may connect half a mile across a field or whatever. And you know, in in terms of that, and in, I, I appreciate what you're agreeing, but has that been any part of your conversation? Because you're saying we need to look after rural people. So, in terms of this new program, has there been a new direction in that, or can the one, the one example that I that I'd highlighted was the work that's been done on some of the water mains. Um, so you'll know from 
the past from the industrial, industrial action issue that happened back in 2015. Uh, a number of small water treatment works went out of service in the West, for example. And because they were relatively isolated and the company couldn't resupply into those areas, um, people lost water you know, for a number of days. And one of the things that we find when we talk to people about the water services, everyone says it's fine, provided it works. And if it doesn't work, you very quickly notice it. So what is proposed in, uh, within the price control is a series of trunk mains that basically start from Balnerisa, Corian, head towards Carmenate, Derry, and Cahill at Dungiven, and really with the objective of reinforcing supplies down through into Straban and Oma um, to address that problem, those isolated works. And there's another aspect of it which Northern Ireland Water has picked up through the again through some of the uh, high temperature events when water supply became difficult in the West, which is the ability to get water to some of the smaller isolated service reservoirs. And again, there's a program of work to increase the size of mains meeting those reservoirs. And I think again, uh, it's, it's, it's always it was not like, nice, nice to work in a perfect organization, but one of the things that Northern Ireland Water has been doing over time is developing its understanding of its asset management and bringing those issues to the fore so they're now being funded. Right, and, and in particular I want you to keep in mind the open countryside as well as the, the smaller towns. Uh, and finally, because the Chair mentioned the number of, of areas where there's lack of capacity, but, but I just want to ask a question, you may be able to respond to this. I mean, a number of the area plans are not complete yet, council area plans, yeah. and, they, and they will designate the number of units we will need over the next 10 years. And I'm just wondering, in, in terms of this PC, I mean, where is that in the round and all of those questions being asked? Because, you know, the PC 2127 over the next six years has identified capacity and the lack of capacity, but surely even area council area plans haven't been developed yet. So, how does that match up? Or would you like to respond? Yes, the, the company, in terms of putting forward its analysis of its wastewater treatment capacity, and this really, really relates to the treatment works themselves driver for this, have worked with the councils and working with their development plans as they stand and you know, as they currently stand. Now, obviously things may change in the future, but I think there's, again, there's enough information there to know which areas are overloaded and those are probably the areas we're dealing with now and as those works are addressed, <coughs> then there's a decision to be made about how much capacity to build in at that time. But I don't think we're at a point yet where I'd be too concerned about the uncertainty. I'm more concerned about the funding being available. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hildage, Deputy Chair. Thanks, Chair. And uh, again, like uh, two or three questions already answered there, so it's always a good presentation when that happens. Uh, I still have a couple though. Uh, COVID. Uh, I understand that the, the chief executive had uh, written out to company saying that they were not to pick up the furlough assistance. Is that correct? No, that is not correct. Not correct. Uh, we wrote out to companies in relation to it and asking what their what their intentions were. Right. Because obviously the price control allows for an amount of money that consumers pay. Mm -hmm. So if consumers are paying for a member of staff, for government to also be paying for that member of staff would have been of concern. So we would want visibility of what was actually happening and, and what their plans were. Um, uh, I don't believe that any, I'm not aware at this point in time of any company within networks that has uh, taken up the furlough scheme. Okay, well, thanks for that clarification. And, um, you mentioned in the slides as well there that sometimes you can't have competition on certain areas. Just could you elaborate on that? Well, we don't have two water companies. We have one, Northern Ireland Water. So the only place you can get your water supply is from yeah, Northern Ireland Is there anything water. further down the ladder? We have, um, well, apart from the network companies, we also do price controls on a, a few suppliers where the competition uh, in some areas hasn't progressed to the stage where we were comfortable removing the price controls. So part of the Power NI uh, um, uh, charges are still regulated and there is a a couple of gas companies where they still have <coughs> regulated prices as well. Okay, thanks for that. And um, 
on the constraints on development issue, there's obviously a challenge in times out there. There's absolutely, absolutely no doubt about it. But <coughs> one area I'd been asking a question around would have been: Has NI Water taken on board where there would potentially be reductions, i.e., housing being removed, factories closing down, and whatnot, going into a system? I, I don't think I have a clear answer from anyone so far, but would you be aware of scrutinising <coughs> things? Would, would that be taken into account? That actually, the reduction in areas were. I've I've not seen anything that takes account of reductions in areas. It's an interesting point. There's areas which have been devastated from an industrial point of view, large factory, and they're all gone. And what are we working on historic data, or has that all been taken into? <coughs> yes, the, the, the company will be working on the particularly in terms of the, the industrial component of it, the current trade effluent data that it has and the consents which are in place. Um, if an industry is left, it will have left. I think the, I suppose the difficulty is, is trying to make an estimate of what might leave in the future, and I've not seen that done in my experience. No, it was raised with me through local government, actually, and can, after a lot of closures in the Mid and East Andrum area, and, which is the fact that by the constraints, to be honest. And, <coughs> Which is great in that aspect of the, the figures, you know. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Ms. Anderson. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Tonya and John, for the presentation. Uh, you recently published a consultation on the draft determination and um, of NA Waters business plan, and I'm wanting to find out how does that draft determination compare to the funding identified by NA Water. Um, as John indicated, we have assessed their business plan and what we've presented to you is, is that determination and what we believe is, is, is appropriate funding. What was the differential between what they had their funding model was and yours? So on the, on the, on a, you'll forgive me if I can't remember all of the figures, but on the capital side they were asking for about $1.9 billion and our determination is $1.68. And again, I'll just to clarify those were an eighteen nineteen prices, just in case others put different numbers to you. Um, and I'm sorry I, I don't have the operational cost numbers at my fingertips, but the overall reduction that we would achieve would be seventy three million in total across six years compared to the company's plan. And has that been discussed with NI Water and what is their response to your draft determination? That, that's so we, we sent our draft determination to them on the thirtieth of September. Um, the consultation will close on the 16th of December. Um, I would expect that we will have discussions with the company before then, but we haven't had feedback from them as yet. When we get to the point of that consultation response coming back, we then work on our final determination, which we publish um, 16th of March. Okay, that's a good time for us to know. Um, I'm quite concerned in relation to the wastewater treatment plant uh, and the lack of capacity in the Derry, the North West of Foyle constituency, particularly uh, in Derry, uh, in an area called Skeg on Cranor Road, where there's the potential for 600 houses, much yeah. needed ho homes to be built, but because of the lack of capacity. So um, I know that in terms you're regulating and you, know, you may have a different role, but the differentiation uh, between what NA Water is looking for and what your determination is, that wouldn't impact on such developments on, for instance, the Skeg Road, the Bunkrana Road, or anywhere where there's a lack of wastewater treatment plants? No, I know there's, there's proposals in the plan for that development, particularly in terms of there's the, a water main to feed it. So yeah. that, that's one of the issues in capacity. Yeah. And there's issues in capacity being addressed. Okay. Uh, just one more final question. You mentioned uh, about a Brexit coordination team when we were looking through the documentation, and you said you had asked NI Water about risk management when NI Water was in front of the committee. They had said that in the event of a crash out Brexit, that the materials that they had to purchase to purify the water to make sure we've clean drinking water, that the cost of that would increase. Have they given you an estimation of what that cost would be? Uh, we haven't received any detailed costings from Northern Ireland Water, either in relation to additional costs for Brexit or additional costs associated with COVID. Okay, and are you pursuing those? 
that information? We would expect them to come back to us whenever they have detailed information. At this point in time, there is an expectation that some costs will increase, <coughs> but they might not be significant enough that would be considered worthwhile reopening our determination. We won't know until we see them. I think this committee would like to hear that because they give us the impression when they were talking to NI Water when they were presented to us that there could be a, maybe a significant increase particularly in the chemicals that is required for the purification of the water. So any information that you receive, obviously, we would, uh, we would like to be furnished with that. Can I ask you just lastly the Brexit question on the All-Ireland electricity market? You have, uh, is, is there any concerns about the All-Ireland electricity market, regardless of whatever happens at the end of the year? Our understanding is that there is no intention to make any change in relation to the wholesale market. It has added value for consumers in Northern Ireland. It has added value for consumers in Southern Ireland. It, it, having it existing keeps prices as cheap as they can be for consumers on the whole island of Ireland. And we are strongly of, of Even position. if there's a crash out Brexit and something were to go terribly wrong and it looks like we're heading into Our understanding is the market will continue to function. This is an area that we've looked at and looked at very closely and worked very closely with our colleagues in, in uh, Dublin, uh, Commission for uh, Regulation of Utilities, CRU. And uh, it is our intention that we'll continue to do that. And we've hired no reassurance. direction otherwise. And we don't expect to, because there's been very positive statements made uh, by um, all political um, uh, areas, both uh, in London and in Dublin, to continue the, the wholesale market because okay. of the value. Good, good, that reassurance. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Mm -hmm. Kelly. Am I, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Well, how do I do this? All oh, right, you can hear me, yes? Yes. Loud and clear. Sorry. Um, they, uh, thanks very much for the presentation, and I think we're all very acutely aware of the um, crisis with the, within the um, infrastructure, both in water and in uh, other roads projects. But you, you may be aware that um, the Department of Infrastructure is having a review into planning policy. And uh, I just wonder around the regulator's role. I'm finding that the costs uh, have escalated substantially for people wanting to bring electricity across to individual homes. I just wonder, do you examine those costs? Uh, and if so, what are your findings? And the other uh, bit was around the um, enforcement policies, whether it's the department or local authorities in relation to developers who um, make the minimum terms in terms of uh, sewage and water connections. And uh, we have a few issues uh, that I'm sure are repeated across constituencies in relation uh, to how people who have bought their houses in good faith, but the developer subse subsequently hasn't lived up to uh, the full uh, requirements of the planning conditions. And it seems to fall between two stools. It's not NIW and the powers that local authorities have seem to be insufficient in forcing the developer uh, to comply. I will touch on the connection costs and ask Jan John to talk a little bit about the development issue, which we're aware of. Uh, in relation to connection costs, NI's costs are something we regulate. It's, it's part of their price control process. And they have a statement of charges which identifies unit costs for the different activities that might be required for any connection. But each connection is specific to the individual, depending on how they're designing it. They obviously do the least cost, technically ex most technically acceptable, but it will be specific to the connection requested. Um, we are the dispute body for this. If you feel that NI has overcharged you, you can raise a dispute with us, and we will investigate the actual costs that you have been charged. But um, the reason um, costs uh, tend to be higher for, for rural connections is the amount of additional equipment required to actually put the connection in place. I myself live in a, a field and uh, I'm very aware of the, the higher cost I would have had to somebody who was maybe in a housing development. Uh, so. Chair, if I could just come back briefly. Thanks for that. The, the, there is a, um, a power that the department has uh, around Wayleaf where they, where you maybe you have a good neighbour who allows you to connect to what they've already spent, you know, 
in terms of getting their house connected or else you have another neighbour who uh, doesn't uh, doesn't actually give the person who's building a new property um, the authority to link in. Are, are there any uh, dispute resolution powers that you might have around those sorts of fallouts? Or is there a way in which any charges that um, the, the first applicant incurs can then be recompensed by greater cooperation with the second applicant, if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, the powers in relation to compulsory wages st- sit with the Department for the Economy. And if NIE has difficulty uh, and cannot achieve a way leave uh, to build the least cost technically acceptable connection, they do go to the department. And there are a number of um, uh, compulsory way leaves that exist in Northern Ireland, and that is a process that NI can go through. Obviously, they have an ongoing relationship with that landowner, so they prefer not to use compulsory processes because they have to get in to access the equipment to maintain it at a later stage. But the UR, the utility regulator, has no role in, in, in that process, and we haven't been given any role by government. Thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll ask John now to talk a bit about the um, the issue around housing estates and um, uh, sewerage connections. And just in, in terms of the uh, <coughs> connections to sewer, I'm, I'm assuming that we're we're looking at an issues which relate to uh, the adoption of sewers by Northern Ireland Water. Mm-hmm. Um, ultimately, it's it's for the developer <coughs> to satisfy Northern Ireland Water that it has complied with the requirements of the sewers for adoption. And ultimately, actually, it's it's for the the individuals who have the relationship with the developer to take it up with the developer. Now, we have some powers in terms of connections to sewers, in terms of hearing appeals and disputes, but they are relatively limited. And I must say, I can even remember two examples in the last 10 years, whereas uh, a, a dispute has come to us in relation, one, to the cost of connections, and the other related sewers for adoption. So it's not something we particular experience in, and it's not something we I think we have a particular role in as a as an enforcement body ourselves. So. Do you see a gap in any of the legislation or powers that could be afforded to yourselves to assist in such a conflict or disputes? I think I'd, I'd always be cautious about us as a body getting involved in disputes which are between an individual and their and a, a body which is a developer that we don't regulate. Um, I think I'd be very cautious about that. Uh, we don't have powers to, basically. Mm. We can only do what legislation allows us to do. So um, if someone's to raise such a dispute which is outside our powers, we would mm. have to uh, uh, say unfortunately not. But. There is also the Consumer Council Northern Ireland who uh, do engage in these matters. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Beggs. Yeah, and thank you for your, for your presentation. Um, my first query is regarding uh, a sli- one of your slides involving uh, bills and, and revenues. And in it, uh, you indicate that, that you're expecting to be a dr- reduction of £195 for typical large metered pro- uh, <coughs> businesses and uh, 20, a reduction of £22 for smaller metered businesses, uh, but an increase of £5 in the notional household costs. So my question is, what are the drivers that are going on here? Is it companies with meters being more efficient and environmentally friendly? Uh, and what are the implications for the public purse? It's... Um in terms of the way that we, we do the price control, we, we work out the revenue required first, then look at the consumer base that's available to pay that revenue. Um, what you're seeing, I think, in those figures is firstly a, a slight increase in water consumption in domestic properties, uh, partly possibly related to COVID and people working at home more. And that's part of the reason you see the increase in the uh, domestic notional bill, which is the part of the revenue which flows into subsidy paid for by the department. What you're also seeing then is the, in terms of the small, unmetered, non-domestic, an increase in, cons- in, in bill, which in partly relates to the fact that Northern Ireland Water have not 
increased bills for those consumers over a number of years, and therefore effectively they're lagging behind in the amount of money they paid. So we are basically fixing something which has happened in the past. And then what you're seeing with the non-domestic bills, is re uh, sorry, the, the non-domestic meter bills, is they're the people who are be sort of benefiting from that reallocation of revenue. And I think it's, again, it's one of the issues which we've highlighted to other people that we've talked to that we're interested in feedback on, on this determination. Because ultimately where you get is to the point where this affects real people. This is a, a process and a mechanism that gets to a rational answer, but it has a real life impact on bills and we're interested in feedback and the kind of issues that you're raising. So, so they, uh, are you saying the notional cost of both parties uh, is more realistic in, un, in, in, under this price review than what was there previously? No, I think it's, it's no, no I, I wouldn't say that, um, but it's, it, both are right. Um, what we're doing is reflecting changing circumstances of movements in water demand. Um. One of the points you made earlier on was that um, uh, the lack of three-year capital budgeting uh, had an impact in, in, in associated costs and ability to deliver projects. Are you able to put a figure on that as to what the cost implication uh, to Northern Ireland Water of not having a three-year budget is? No, I, th I think it, we, we haven't put a figure on it. And we don't. Uh, I think we, we could put a figure on it particularly. It simply makes it harder to deliver. Um, when you're trying to plan a, a project, and many projects in Northern Ireland Water do maybe of the order of, say, you know, less than a million pounds, they can be accommodated within a one-year budget. But if you're looking at larger projects, you know, sort of the tens of millions of pounds projects, which some of these larger treatment works will be, you are looking to plan that over a number of years. You're looking for a commitment to start the project knowing that you can continue it. And you're also looking at that commitment in terms of the supply chain having confidence that the work will be done. We're asking Northern Iron Water to increase its rate of spend quite significantly over this period. And actually, I think we're, if I remember the figures rightly, we're, we're looking at something which is maybe a 2.5% increase per annum in total construction in Northern Ireland as a result of this for that period. <coughs> the supply chain has to have confidence that it can gear up and provide the people with the skills necessary to do that work. So I think if we if we don't provide that confidence over a three year period there will be a cost. But no we have not attempted to estimate what that cost can you can you allude to the scale of the, the difficulty of not having the three year not not without okay. considering it. Okay. Perhaps if we might consider it might be worthwhile for us all to be aware of it, to, to, to uh, be aware of the subsequent implications. Um, the final point then uh, that I have is this issue, and it reflects a little bit of what you said of, of uh, increasing capital requirements going forward uh, and giving confidence to, to, to um, companies who may have to uh, deliver this new investment. Um, your overall price control mechanism, what value is it if there is not a commitment to provide the money that's built into it by the executive? Are you asking, the value we add through regulation is that we are ensuring that they are providing the services and taking forward and developing uh, a focus on customer service back to our consumer best pra uh, practice project that we're working on. NI Waters um, has reduced and, uh, its costs and become more efficient and has delivered and its um, uh, quality of service to customers has dramatically improved from the first, first price control. We can very clearly evidence the value f of regulation in relation to Northern Ireland Water. If Northern Ireland Water is not fully funded, what will happen is the constraints will not be removed, but they will still continue to improve on their efficiencies for the work they are doing, and we will still continue to drive them to look at innovative ways to do things and improve their level of consumer service. It just means that you're left with an impact on economic growth within Northern Ireland. Again, I'm just trying to clarify. If, if there's not the, the commitment to provide the funding that's needed to follow your plan, does it not make a degree of nonsense of much of your plan that you've put there 
your work that you've put in and the work at Northern Ireland Water will have put in as well as, as has been alluded to earlier that um, hundreds of areas will continue to have insufficient sewage capacity to allow development to occur? No, because there's clear information there about what is the impact of underfunding. We can clearly identify what is not being done and what is being done and could give assurance to the department and yourselves that Northern Ireland Water is being efficient with the monies it has and is delivering the best of its ability within the funding envelope in line with what we would expect uh, any uh, good best practice uh, performing company to do. So we just because they're not removing development constraints does not mean they're not still providing water to their existing consumers and sewage services to their cons existing consumers and we'd expect them to continue to seek to improve on that process back to the, the funding gap or the funding efficiency gap between Northern Ireland Water and other GB companies. We will continue to push them to, to move forward in, in improving their services. One final brief question for me in terms of electricity uh, connections. There has been uh, criticism of the cost that NIE puts down on some connections, you know, particularly there has been re renewable energy uh, connection costs. How is that monopoly situation managed so realistic costs are put forward? Northern Ireland Water, or Northern Ireland Water, sorry, Northern Ireland NIE Networks, their names changed recently, uh, uh, basically as part of the price control process identify their costs just the same as Northern Ireland Water does and they identify what they're hoping to do for both capital works and, and their OPEX expenditure. The costs they use for replacing poles or transformers or any of those connections are the same costs that they would apply to somebody asking for a new connection. So we scrutinise their costs. They then put those costs as a, as a, a budget into their charging statement. And as I, I mentioned earlier, if you feel that you have not been charged the appropriate amount, you can raise a dispute with us and we will investigate it. And is there full transparency of how those costs are uh, put together so that it's not a subsidiary company of NIE that some nope. of the costs full, are hidden. Full transparency. We know their labour costs. We know their overhead costs. We know the costs to purchase type, different types of equipment and, and replace different types of equipment or build new, because they also build new capital works uh, to increase capacity as well as just building connections. And it's the same staff who are doing both. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Okay, thank you, Tanya and John. I just want to follow on briefly from. Um, Rice point, see the 1.7 per cent increase. What's that based on on an average bill? Is that actual water consumption, or is that a 1.7 increase on a bill in general? Um, we've presented some figures on um, the pound note sign value of the bills in that slide. Okay. I think the, the, the 1.7 per cent that figure the, is the return on capital. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is essentially the cost of debt and equity of financing, not not the increase in bills. And as I said, we we're starting from a point of view that our price limits, which are a technical issue which we deal with, are zero. But what we've highlighted in that table is within that zero overall increase in bills. Some people pay more and some people pay less. And what is driving that is the movement in the amount of water consumption. Uh, between various consumer groups, and also I mentioned the fact that some consumers had price increases had not been applied to them in the past by Northern Ireland Water. Um, that small group of non-domestic, unmetered consumers, and they're the people who are seeing that increase in bills. Um, okay. The second point, and, and Ms Kelly and Mr Vague has, has touched on it regarding NIE networks, and I'm not specifically picking them out, but there is an, a narrative, and there is, you know, uh, in the rural area, whenever a, 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 an NIE supply comes into a building, it's, it could be astronomical, the costs. Are you confident there's enough competition there? Because some of the costs are ex extremely, ex you know, once inflated, but they're too, they're too expensive for, for what the customer is getting. Are you confident there's enough competition in that sector, like they're delivering this, the, the network to the, the, the consumer? The NIE policy for connections is semi-shallow. So you're, but you're paying for the new assets that are required because of your new need. Um, we have now introduced a form uh, uh, contestability for all connections in Northern Ireland a couple of years ago. 
and that was uh, because we were aware of, of the interest in this and the concern that there wasn't competition. Mm. And we did that in such a way so that the live companies active in the contestable market in GB could move over here and uh, build connections uh, without uh, having to make substantial changes so that it was attractive for them. And a large number of these independent connection providers have registered in Northern Ireland and some of them are active in the market. So anyone can go and get a quote from one of these ICPs, independent connection providers, for their connection. Uh, I think what people are finding is the costs are, are, are similar. They're not necessarily saving substantial money. And in fact, I believe some people are willing to pay more to the independent connection provider to get the, the connection faster. You know, because it depends what personally is of interest to you, and that's good. That that is a choice that is now available, and, and we're, we're very welcome of the fact we have contestability. And I would also like to highlight that NIE Networks worked very positively with them, with us to try and bring this forward uh, as quickly as they could. Uh, so there wasn't anything where they were trying to be protective of this area of work and not allow us to introduce contestability. So the network is set up that. Um, the infrastructure was built based on original need. So if you're in an area where the infrastructure is not there and you want to, to uh, a connection, you under the current charging policy, you are required to pay the assets that are, are needed. Um, that is something that it's, if, if government wishes that to change, it's within the gift and it's something that maybe DfE can look at as part of their energy strategy. But um, that is the position at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Ms. Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and thank you both um, for your presentation. I suppose a lot of the stuff has been covered, so I've only just a few small points. Um, just in the report, you'd mentioned around enforcement, and um, I know you'd said there was a donation of almost a half a million to local charities, and, and it was really just to kind of get a wee bit of an idea around enforcement activity and what, what that entails. Uh, well, we have had um, a, a number of. We have a very clear documented process. So, whenever we consider that somebody might be in breach of licence, mm -hmm. um, we would inform them and start a process. But we allow them to come to a, a resolution early on if they're particularly helpful and sort of put their hands up and go, "Yes, we will address this." Yeah. And what we then do is we seek them to make a charitable donation. It's not to be in a way that they get publicity for it because obviously uh, we've found a failing and they've admitted to it and this is a redress, mm -hmm. so it's not something they should necessarily get positive publicity for. The total so far is 845,000 in Northern Ireland and th that has come from electricity suppliers who have not carried out all of the activities we'd expect in terms of license and protection for consumers. The issues we have are when people try to switch, it maybe hasn't been working effectively or some of the, the marketing processes haven't been uh, in line with what we would expect in terms of license compliance. Uh, we have had one network company where we carried out an enforcement uh, because it turns out that they had allocated uh, monies inappropriately and um, uh, that was our, our first enforcement. So. I mean, our job is, is not necessarily that we want to enforce licences. We want regulated companies to comply with their licences and deliver value for consumers. So enforcement is a last step, a last stage, but it's something we have in our tool belt and it's something we're not afraid to use. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you, Tanya. Um, and you'd, you'd mentioned around uh, supporting renewables as, as one of the areas that um, will influence the work of yourselves over, the, over your five-year strategy. So it was really just to see, as a utility regulator, how um, you achieve or what, what you do to try and help us achieve a, a net zero um, future and, and how you see that panel out. Well, historically, we have obviously been aware of, um, uh, I suppose, the, the ongoing process of connecting renewables. Um, I have been working with a regulator nearly 13 years, but before that, I worked for Northern Ireland Electricity for 19 as a, an engineer connecting wind farms. So one of the pieces of work that the regulator did, and I was involved with when I started, was looking at connection policy and how we can ensure we connect renewables in a way that... Um, facilitates meeting government's target of 40%. And a clustering policy was something that's been developed for renewable generation, where you build a cluster and they connect, rather than have multiple 
wirescape, it's called, lots of lines that aren't necessary. Um, but what we're currently doing right now is engaging with the department, and, and we rep are represented in all its thematic groups, and we're also represented at a, a strategic level, uh, the Department of the Economy, on developing its energy strategy. We are also, uh, uh, you're aware, European legislation has, has a lot of pieces in it which are, are aimed towards um, uh, promoting renewables and, and facilitating renewables. And obviously, we work to ensure that regulated companies have the appropriate licence conditions and comply with European legislation and are also moving forward in terms of being able to, to meet government targets in terms of, of, of net zero. Um, we, within our corporate uh, strategy, when we reviewed it a couple of years ago, trying to think of how long ago it was now. The years are going awfully quickly yeah. these days. Um, but uh, one of the things is we made it clear is that we needed to take into zero carbon emissions. I would say net zero now, because it's not just about carbon, it's about, it's about all the greenhouse gases and how we, uh, we see it as very much our role to ensure that uh, we facilitate whatever government policy is there. Yeah, I suppose just when you mentioned in terms of the EU legislation, that's probably there's a lot of probably uncertainty around that now. Even going forward, how that will work with with Brexit and and you know no clear path as to what way that's going to work out. Well, we have put in place most of the network code, all of the network codes that we're required to put in place up until this date, and th those codes are still being finalised. I mean, there's some that are still under consultation and, and will be closing in a number of weeks. So we will be fully compliant. Um, uh, come, um, we are fully compliant now. I'm not suggesting we're not, but those codes and those changes are all there to try and move towards net zero. And because they're still being put in now, we will then build on those in terms of the activities that we expect going forward. We've been engaging with NIE and Sony, who are both actively engaged with the department, very proactively in terms of being sort of shovel ready with, you know, and, and carrying out, I suppose. Um, no regrets actions to ensure that we are ready to go uh, and we are doing what is needed to get towards um, uh, net zero. One of the big things that the uh, we recently closed our, our consultation on the Sony uh, price control, which is obviously the transmission system operator for Northern Ireland. And within that, we identified what we were doing in that price control and requirements that we are putting on Sony to ensure they are going to be in a position to continue on towards net zero. One of the big things in there is open data, making information available to everybody who might be interested in sort of engaging in this market uh, and not having it just sort of a, uh, less accessible in the past. I mean, traditionally, electricity came from three or four power stations in Northern Ireland, and the transmission system operator made sure it went to homes and businesses. We didn't have the level of renewable energy we now have. We're now up to, I think it's 48 per cent, which is a, a testament to the good work that both the department has done, uh, Department of Economy, we have done, and also the regulated companies have done with us looking within our price control process to ensure that they are able to um, to deliver for consumers. Um, RP6 is the current Northern Ireland electricity price control, and within it we give consideration to growth of EVs, growth of heat pumps, and um, also uh, you know, what is going to be needed for renewable um, generation going forward. And um, I say all of this is what we do is we put together a plan, the same as we've done for Northern Ireland Water, and we will consult on it and we engage with the company. And then we will make a final determination. And the next, I suppose, big project once we've finished um, um, PC21 will be RP7, because uh, the Sony price control, we hope to do a final determination on it uh, prior to uh, the end of 2020. But, okay. uh, That's there's fine. a Thank you. huge amount of work going yeah. on, basically. I could talk a long time on this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank okay. you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, and I thank you for your presentation. My question was in relation to the impact of Brexit, which Mrs Anderson asked, and we appreciated the very definitive response that you give in relation to that, because it's a very important issue. Um, and you're confident then that no matter what the outcome is in the negotiations, the impact will not be significant upon businesses and consumers? We're confident we're still getting water, <laughs> and the sewage system will still work. Yeah. We're not confident, and the electricity will still flow. We're not confident on any long-term impacts in terms of, of, of costs, and I don't think anyone could be confident <laughs> on, on that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else further that would like to ask? 
No, thank you. Thank you very much for your, your presentation, taking time this morning then to, to answer questions. And no doubt we'll be in contact again um, and, and speak to you in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. We very much appreciate it. Uh, back to the COVID point earlier. Thank this you. is the first time John and I have been in the same room and since early March. <laughs> uh, so it was nice to actually see that he's, uh, it wasn't just a hologram. <laughs> so uh, anyway, and it's nice to actually be Stay in a room safe. with people. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Anything that you'd like to follow up on as a consequence of that, um, that session? Anything further that you'd like to follow up with? Are you content at this stage? Chair, I think it would be something we may have to come back to once we know what's going to happen with regards to Brexit. Chair, just on that, and I know it's not, um, it's not their responsibility, but it's probably part of something that Dolores mentioned, and, uh, the issue of connection, the NAE and all. I mean, Part of the planning, or something, there's some way we need to to look at mm -hmm. that overall connection. With not just a one size fits all. All of these parts make up the whole part of the planning process. Absolutely. And, and we just definitely need to look at it. To be fair, whatever we can do as a committee to try and incorporate all that stuff. Yeah, you know. Okay, but there, there may be something that we maybe need to do in conjunction with the economy committee. Um, yeah. In relation to that, so perhaps if, um, if you're content that maybe company staff. Um, look back on that section of the um, of the session, and um, perhaps then we could um, write to the economy committee on the basis of that, um, just to see what correspondence maybe they've received as well, and what communication they've had with the minister. In terms of the regulations and all, who's responsible, yeah, and then see might, what we can do. It might be useful right across to, the departments as It might be useful to explore that just yeah. as a, a, a as a cross departmental piece. Ms. Kelly. Yeah, sorry, can I, thanks very much for that, Carol. But could, could I ask, maybe, it'd be interesting to find out what time is taken, you know, the process, if I could find out from the Economy Committee, just in terms of many requests and just the process, is the difficult one or uh, one that um, uh, consumers find easy to navigate? Yeah. Okay, members content? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Moving then on to item 10 at page 285 of your pack, you'll find the departmental briefing paper for um, the Transport Regulation Unit. Um, just to remind you that Hansard will record the session um, and we'll welcome um, Chris Hughes, who's the Director of Safe and Accessible Travel, and David Mullen, who is the Head of the Transport Regulation Unit. You're both very welcome to committee this morning. Thank you for coming. Um, and if you'd like to open with uh, uh, some remarks and members will follow with some questions. Thank okay. you. Chair, thank you. Um, so I'll make some brief remarks um, with your indulgence. So um, the Transport Regulation Unit is uh, set up to regulate the transport industry. Its aims are to ensure fair competition among operators so that um, those who are operating legally and fairly are supported and those that are not are addressed and challenged. It's also to improve road safety and to minimise the uh, impact of operating centres on the environment. Um, the department seeks to achieve these objectives through a process of education, which has been particularly important as the COVID uh, crisis has impacted on us. Licensing operators with a focus on licensing only those which are compliant with the regulations and taking regulatory action against uh, licensed operators that are not complying with the uh, with the required regulations. Um, the, uh, the paper sets out what, the, what is required from that, the uh, being of good standing, uh, for, uh, um, good finances, being of repute and your establishment, so there are criteria which need to be met to be of good standing. Um, there were a number of, of historical issues that the Transport Regulation Unit would um, historically has been addressing. Um, these have been exacerbated by the impact of COVID-19. So um, what we had was a, a range of issues which are set out in the paper chair. So um, we had the issues around um, public hearings. So um, there was a, a difficulty in getting those. That was uh, coincided with the issue about the skill set required to hold public hearings. 
Um, there had been a lot of progress on the locations for, for public hearings, which have been going forward, which was then negatively impacted by the, uh, the advent of COVID, um, which set things aside. So um, those issues are, are set out in your paper. Um, we actually have a, an update to paragraph 18, which was obviously at the time. So if you, if you would indulge me, um, it's paragraph 18 of your paper sets out that um, we were looking to... Uh, we were working through the, the outworkings of how we could hold public inquiries. We actually successfully held a public, uh, a public hearing. Now, it wasn't an inquiry, it was a, a detention hearing um, this day last week. So that took place virtually. So the, um, we have actually now established virtual hearings. Now that requires the agreement of the person who to the hearing, but we had um, a deputy traffic commissioner from uh, GB who took the hearing and that went successfully. So we've now established that as a mechanism that we can use taking forward. And that's on foot of a lot of work that has taken place post COVID. We had, a, because of the skill shortage, we had sourced um, deputy, uh, deputy traffic commissioners from the UK who had agreed to uh, come across to Northern Ireland to um, undertake the hearings. That was impacted by COVID, but they have subsequently agreed to um, take the uh, hearings online or face to face, uh, depending on the public health uh, the, the public health advice at the time. Um, in the meantime, um, other work that the unit has taken has been going on to address the backlog, which does exist. Uh, for example, licensing work um, has continued, and that has been slowed by um, by COVID, but actually has has continued. And then there was the information about uh, management information coming from DVSA that has continued to progress despite COVID. It has been slowed down a bit because DVSA have had to enact their public health advice, and people have been working from home. Plus, they are also so updating their IT system, so that is progressing, but it's slower than it would have been uh, before this um, uh, before this uh, took place. Um, so that was really just a quick outline of the of the situation as it is. We are addressing the historical issues. Work has been going on. COVID has come along. We've progressed that as much as possible. We're still dealing with the issues there, uh, Chair. So that was. That was a quick outline. Okay, thank you very much. And you've referenced a number of times the issues in relation to a skill shortage. What skills are required that are specific to this role that you're finding difficulty with? So, David, would you like to? Yeah, um, the uh, the act of being a presiding officer is essentially a judicial skill, and um, in GB, it's barristers by and large um, that undertake that role. So, when we looked at the the requirement to preside over, um, pulling together the information, pulling that casework is in essence the more straightforward administrative process, mm -hmm. but actually ensuring that you give a fair and open hearing because the outcome of these hearings could be revocation of license and loss of business. So it's a very, very judicial process and um, the scope obviously of, of getting through that and doing that in the manner that's right and correct um, is the skill set that essentially is missing. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't think that there was a shortage of barristers in Northern Ireland. <laughs> oh no, no, but, no, 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 appreciate um, that, of course. It, but is, there, is, there, is there a <laughs> lack of is there, is there a lack of people maybe coming forward to present themselves to do the role? Is that more the issue no. than actually the skill? What what we really have to do going forward, and we haven't really commenced this process because we're looking really at clearing the backlog first and foremost. Um, long term, there will be a requirement to look at what the role looks like going forward. In terms of dealing with the backlog, we have access to um, presiding officers, experienced presiding officers in GB that can hear these. When we look back at when we started this process, the expectation was it would be a very, very quick turnover, allowing us time then to look at what the future of transport regulation unit looked like. Um, obviously, the impact of COVID-19 has stretched that out. In fact, the original terms of engagement with the deputy traffic commissioners for six months had expired, and we've had to renew those. And there has been, because it's the, the nature of the process is judicial, there has been criticism from the upper tribunal, not about any of the decisions, but about the, the, pro, the, the process that has, manner. that has gone through. So having the skills of the deputy traffic commissioners, they are very, very familiar and they're very familiar with the process. And as David said, this is an, this is a process which can result in people having losing their vehicle or their or their livelihood or their license. So you know it's it's one that um, needs to be given the, the proper skill set. Okay. Um, now, I know that a number of years ago there was a discussion in relation to sort of a, review, a strategic review of TRU. Where does that actually sit at the moment? 
Yeah, so we had approached business consultancy services on that, um, and they had a difficulty at the time in terms of putting it into their, their calendar. It's still something that uh, ministers looking to be done. Uh, but again, the focus at this stage is about getting the public inquiry backlog, um, getting that cleared up as much as possible so we can then understand what the requirements are going forward. Um, the backlog, I suppose, is clouding the position because we're looking at a number of around 70, whereas in fact on an ongoing basis we shouldn't really be looking at any more than 12 per year, 24 per year. Okay, but we're in a situation where we have a backlog, we have a lack of personnel, we can't find a location for to hold the, the meetings. I mean, yeah. there's, there's clearly a problem here that yeah. would require a, quite a, an urgent review rather than something which is sort of kept in view somewhere along the line. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that it is a matter that we want dealt with as quickly as possible. Um, as, as David has said, I, I mean, what we were trying to do was because there is a potential impact on the operation of. Uh, so, whenever we have a backlog of cases, that has two potential impacts. First is that people who are non-compliant with the regulations can continue to operate and undercut legitimate operators. So that is a that is an immediate concern. The second one is that legitimate operators are potentially being. Um, Having difficulties in expanding, so they're, they're ha so those are of immediate concern. Steps had been taken to to put the review in place, but unfortunately, though there were the difficulties that stated, it doesn't mean that it's not. Some, we're very conscious of the urgency of it. It's just uh, it's just that while in parallel with that, we have been focusing on addressing those issues which are on the table in front of us. Um, Yes, I, I, I agree with you completely. That it is something that needs to progress as a matter of urgency. Okay. Um, and can you maybe talk to me in relation to the most serious infringements issue and obviously um, the information that comes um, to TRO, particularly from, um, from the mainland? Um, just, you know, when, when do these date back to? I mean, have you got a considerable backlog in relation to that? Um, how many have you received, probably from GBS, was is, is a question that we would need to look at, and really, just can you confirm that the information that you do receive is accurate, and how you check that? So, yeah, um, within Transport Regulation Unit, our, our work essentially commences from uh, from us receiving a referral or notification of, of wrongdoing, and over the last lot of years. The, with regards to the serious infringements and very serious infringements, which are categorizations, uh, that has been coming across on an individual case-by-case -case basis. What we found out, um, and again, it predates um, my time at TRU, was that the MSIs, those most serious infringements, hadn't been notified. And it seems to stand back to 2016, whenever the classifications were put in place. Um, now, what we have done then is engage with uh, DVSA to try and understand why, first and foremost, those infringements haven't been notified. And it's related to the fact that within DVSA and GB, the assessment of those infringements tends to happen within DVSA, and then a case file is produced to the Traffic Commissioner. Within Northern Ireland, tra Transport Regulation Unit assesses the information as well as then calls the public inquiry. So in essence, in GB, the information wasn't being presented on a case-by-case -case basis to the, Transport Man to, the sorry, to the Traffic Commissioner. In Northern Ireland, it should have been. Um, they have since presented us with a 10-year MSI report, and I'll confess we're still working through the detail of that. Um, it is significant, and I do have information. Pardon me a second. Um, we've received a 10-year report, which um, is currently sitting with just short of 7,000 MSIs, which is a very, very significant volume, and that will affect approximately 850 operators. Um, now. We haven't yet got to the process of dragging through that information to determine, for example, how many of those operators have since stopped trading, mm -hmm. um, because this is a 10-year report. We then have to assess how we're going to use that information, because our initial reading and understanding of the regulations is that there's no um, limitation statute, so therefore they could all, in effect, be, be used uh, in, a, in a hearing. Um, so we we'll need to seek uh, input from the, the SO on that. And to see what we what we can and can't use. Obviously, there's a weighting issue um, in terms of how much weight we put into the older items. So, if we have an operator, for example, who hasn't had an MSI in five years, then any material prior to that would carry a much lesser weight than an, an operator, for example, that's currently receiving MSIs. So, we have received the report. We are doing a data cleansing exercise on that report currently. There's a lot of the information coming across 
the, there's inconsistency between the operator names, the operator numbers, and so forth. Once we have a consistent approach, we then intend to speak with both the trade organisations, um, the RHA and um, Logistics UK, and the Departmental Solicitor's Office, not necessarily in that order, just to try and understand how we're now going to use this information going forward. Okay. No, those figures are quite astounding. Um, are. <laughs> is there a lack of resource within your unit in order to deal with this? We haven't got to the stage of assessing that as yet. What we're um, expecting to do, if obviously things move forward, is to create a referral on an operator by operator basis. I mean, there's always a, a case where, you know, potentially with additional resources, you could you could do more. But I mean, and there has been um, sort of there's uh, there has been an increase in the staff numbers, but it is more an issue about having first of all got through, got access to the information, and then prioritising. So. Um, I mean, with more people, you can do more, uh, but it's. Uh, I think the process is. There's also potentially a bottleneck. You know, if you have more people processing the administrative side of things, uh, that moves then to decision making. Okay. Yeah. Which kind of goes back to the first point in relation to the review of you know, what you do and how yeah. you do it. Yeah. Um, because no matter what you, I mean, it doesn't seem to matter what you do at the moment. You're still going to meet some kind of bottleneck. Potentially, yes. Uh, but if, I mean, they, having said that, the time scale that we anticipate for being able to address the issues which are on the table at the moment is about six months. If we got so, although there are numbers to work through, certainly the cases that are, are live at the moment, um, if it if it was not for the issues around COVID, I think that we would we had actually got to the stage of putting dates in diaries. And you know, this is so. There's there's two issues really that are that are to be dealt with. There's the steady state. So, which, as David has set out, is potentially two two notifications per month, and then there's the backlog. So, um, and we're breaking those down. But so, when we we think that we could work through the backlog of cases that are on the table at the moment in probably about six months, and now with having managed successfully establish that virtual hearings are out. Now, one of the issues about virtual hearings is that it requires the agreement of the of the other party. To, to do that because they're entitled to a face to face hearing and these are weighty matters and therefore that, that that is that is right. So some of this is not within our control uh, and we can we can put in place all the arrangements we can but you know there are there are, there are potential stumbling blocks um you know that that exists regardless of, of what we do. Okay um, and my final question is just in relation to there are obviously hauliers who are based in Northern Ireland and they are registered and licensed elsewhere, for example in Bulgaria. Um, who are then unregulated, and yet we have hauliers here who are regulated to, um, um, well, it, it makes it quite difficult for them to operate probably the, 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 some of the, the regulations that they have. Um, just how can they then compete competitively with those who are unregulated? Surely there's an unfairness in, in that system. Yeah, so this is the issue of flagging out, as it's known, um, where we would have operators, as you said, uh, operating within Northern Ireland, but using Bulgarian licence, Bulgarian plates, as an example, so other areas within the EU. Um, because Transport Regulation Unit only looks at regulated, you're absolutely right, licensed operators, the guidance only and the legislation only gives us authority to take action against regulated vehicles within um, licensed operators, sorry, within Transport Regulation Unit. It's actually then an enforcement issue in terms of the other operators. Um, the case that um, that Chris referred to earlier on last Wednesday was actually one such incident where EVA had um, detained a vehicle on suspicion of being illegally used, flagging out, and the outcome of that inquiry was um, that the vehicle is to be disposed of. Essentially, takes that vehicle off the road, and really, it's through that mechanism, uh, which is what's going to actually provide a deterrent to those rogue operators and also that assurance and support to legitimate operators. Okay, but moving forward, how can we create a system which is fairer to those who are operating within the law? It is the it is the issue that this is both prongs need to be done. It is both the regulation. So essentially, whenever somebody's in our system, that's a good thing, um, and legitimately they cannot be. But it is then becomes an enforcement issue. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Hildage, Deputy Chair. Thanks, thanks, Chair, and you're very welcome. Uh, things don't appear to be good. <laughs> going by the paper, it's very negative and things aren't in place, various levels, so on and so forth. Uh, you say you're going to return to inquiries in November next month. Yep. Uh, 
that's only two weeks away. How confident are you that that would happen? So we're aiming for the week commencing 23rd of November, and uh, during lockdown, one of the items we're focused on is prioritising cases and pulling together information. Um, prior to lockdown, we had essentially undertaken a lot of exercises around that, uh, pulling together case files and so forth. Unfortunately, as time progresses, the situation is not really changes, so you almost have to revisit that, which is incredibly frustrating, uh, but it's a necessary evil. We're now in a position where um, case files have been presented to the presiding officers, and they're then coming back with final changes to that. Uh, we have to give a statute notice of 28 days to transport managers, 21 days to operators. Um, so those, those call-up call letters are essentially prepared, and once we get the final nod from the presiding officer, they're content with the material within those, then they'll be sent out. Um, so we've provisionally booked the location for hearings on the 23rd of November, and we're looking to start the virtual hearings um, the week commencing 14th. Uh, 14th of December. 14th of December? December yeah. yeah. And you've done quite a bit of work to ensure that these are compliant with the public health guidelines. So as of, as of this morning, we are content that actually we will be able to progress to those now, um, there was a difficulty with prop the, the buildings before getting locations. Yeah. So before COVID, so that's an ongoing situation. It is. Yeah. We've now got um, agreement with the LPS, and uh, we've, we've got third-party accommodation. Um, before COVID, we had come to an agreement with the Northern Ireland Court Service mm -hmm. to use their locations. Um, the difficulty then. The, cut the shutdown of courts, and then they're, they've got their own backlog and so forth. So the courts. Um, for, the, for the time being, aren't available to us. Um, and would the courts would that help you long long term? Post COVID, hopefully. To be determined. Um, post if we have access. Yeah, it, it's if we can get the access. Um, we, we need a. a can they be held in hotels around the country? Around they got these here and There are specifications for the for the accommodation that need to be met. So because it's a hearing, yeah, you okay, need yeah. yeah. So that that's really the issue, which of course makes courts <laughs> ideal. Yeah. Um, so. There's, there's been work has been going on on the long-term solution to this, and we had been making good progress on that actually until COVID happened, and then whenever COVID did happen, there was a focus on actually trying to get hearings up and running. So I mean, that's not looking at being a long-term solution, but actually it does allow us to start the hearings. Uh, as we, there's there appeals after those hearings. The appeals are heard by the uh, upper tribunal, so they're heard in the court. They're heard in court. It's judiciary that looks after that, yeah. Okay. And finally, is there is there anything? If you you've been, uh, you do seem to have been looking to GB uh, to look at what's going on over there, uh, is there anything that you're learning at all that can be introduced here to help the situation? Well, the online hearings is the key that we've learned from the uh, Office of the Traffic Commissioner and GB. I'm in touch with them quite regularly, and in fact, one of the things we're looking at now is around. Um, the, the notice given to an, an operator called to, to a public inquiry, um, seeking their agreement, which Chris had mentioned earlier on, or considering the circumstances of the case, if there's a road safety risk, can we actually call them to um, a virtual hearing? Are these other places suffering backlogs too? Or? Yes, yes, they are. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And there has been training provided by uh, by the the. GB traffic commissioners to the team, so to help, uh, so to help embed some of the learning. So we are we are taking the opportunities for the learning to try and make these things as as, you know, as smooth as possible, essentially. So and would, it, would it be intended to bring traffic or to install traffic commissioners here in Northern Ireland, or just to keep bringing these folk in from across? That, the that would be part of the review the chair part of the review. referred to. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, and thank you, Chris and David. Let me roll back to the start. If I want to operate it tomorrow in layman's or layperson's terms, I should say now, in layman's terms, a operate ten vehicles tomorrow. What's the normal process, briefly? So there will be an application to be submitted, and um, within that application, you'll be asked to provide various pieces of information about your your um, about how you're, what you're intending to practice, where you're intending to be, and so forth. Um, we will assess a number of those factors. Is the operating centre suitable for ten vehicles, for example? You, as an individual, are you of good repute? Do you are you fit to become um, a goods vehicle operator? Um, do you have the financial resources to look after your vehicles, maintain your vehicles? Uh, do you have the sufficient processes? In some instances, you have a requirement on professional competency, dependent upon the type of um, uh, the type of application you put in. So that will require you to have a transport manager 
Uh, you could be the transport manager if you're qualified. Uh, you might have to, to nominate one. Um, so all of that material is assessed. In some instances, it's very black and white. Do you have the financial resources, the ERNA? In some instances, then, there's quite a detailed investigation. Um, you would be expected, for example, to make us aware of any convictions. We'll also then go to statutory bodies and ask for information about you. And if, for example, that were to show that you did have convictions, you didn't declare, that would obviously be an amber flag for us. And sorry for cutting across you. Does the applicant have to be the person that owns the business? Yes. So the license is given to the legal <coughs> entity. So whether that's a, an individual a partnership or a, or a limited company. Yeah. And what's the normal timeline of that? We, we have a target of 40 days. And where last year we were within that target consistently. <clears throat> that target has slipped to about 41, 42 days during the COVID. Um, and I suppose it's important to point out, you know, in terms of numbers, this year we've still processed 327 applications so far this year, um, and that's a round that we're slightly outside the average 40 days. But I think, considering the, the current circumstances, not so bad. So then, and I'm looking at the little table here of non-public <laughs> inquiry and public inquiry for application. Yep. What's the definition then of that application? If you don't mind me asking, given a total of 38. Again, sorry. So this application yeah. here, non-public inquiry, public <coughs> inquiry. So you have 10 non-public inquiries, 28 public inquiries gives me a total of 38 for application. What's the definition of application? So an application is where uh, an individual has either sought to um, create a new license or vary an existing license. Okay, okay, now, enough. if you want to vary a license and you want an extra 15 vehicles, we'll look at how you've managed your license thus far. Um, if you're a good compliant operator, uh, we don't have any issues uh, that will, could be approved immediately. If not, then we'll go through to a decision-making process where we'll try to assess the application. So obviously, if I, let's call it in simple terms, broke the rules, and then going to be, are you putting any emphasis on application process or regulatory process? Are you putting, are you waiting so within your department, which is more important? I know they're important, both of them, but are you yeah. waiting them? Well, we've got a direction on that where we're, we're looking at food safety concerns first and foremost. That's our number one priority. And then applications. And then we'll be looking at those applications on a date-by-date -date -date basis. We've and is that two separate? departments within you, or is it the no. same people? No, it's the same people. Right. Once and it goes to this level of decision making, it's the same group. And what, what's your uh, capacity for that as a number of staff doing that? You know, is it well, we've met the targets, so... Um, they, are you referring to the capacity to look after the hearings? Yes. Sorry. Um, yes. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's the same, um, same team, as I said, to look after each. We have a number of caseworkers that will be leading in terms of pulling together the information, and then there are essentially three decision makers, including myself and two deputies. So that hasn't changed the number of staff over this past number of years, and no? They have changed, yeah. They've In gone what up. way? It's gone up. Gone up? Yeah. For what? Or For what reason? To fill vacancies. Okay. Yeah. So you referred then to you're going to have these um, number of inquiries completed by when? Six, what did you say, six months, did you say? Or? It's, we had anticipated six months initially. And this is when we're looking back. December, November last year. Mm -hmm. Our expectation was six months. Um, a number of the hearings can be heard conjoined. Uh, so, for example, if you have an application from an operator, um, but there's a concern that this is actually maybe a front for another operator, you might call both those together. So it's not as if there's necessarily, although there's, um, there's 70 um, operators being called to a public inquiry, there's one of the ones we're looking at at the minute is actually three, three of those operators being, being called together. So okay. our expectation, sorry to answer the question, is about six months. Yeah. That may well change depending on how the public. So what, what was those figures like? And this is my final question, Chair. What's the, what was those figures like prior to COVID? As COVID obviously created a problem, no doubt. But what yeah. was those figures approximately? I don't even know exactly. Which, but what were they like prior to COVID? Which which figures? The, the, the regulatory figures, you know. The caseload. Yes. Yeah, I thought I actually had them there. Um, they were um, around the 50 mark, so they've gone up a bit. Um, now we have also taken some off the list or mm. changed the prior the classification. So some of those um, in-chamber preliminary hearings, which are the non-public inquiry, mm. uh, the expectation is that they're more of an education piece. Uh, the likely outcome of regulatory action be quite minimal. In some instances, a review of those and the, the information relating to that operator might have changed, and we've increased that. Uh, in some instances, you have applications that are actually no longer being pursued and so forth. So that was part of the exercise around December, November, try and get 
a clearer picture of where we're at and where we're going. So you, you do have the number that came in since COVID, don't you? The, they've been coming in about two a month, isn't that the...? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, about two a month is the, is the sort of what comes in on a regular basis. So well, while we're delayed, that's, that's what yeah. it starts to increase by. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for your presentation. And most, of the, most of the stuff has been touched upon, but I just want to follow up on some of the things, because, David, you were saying there, um, 12, roughly it was 12 per, per year. Well, I'd of. say, sorry, it's probably closer to, we're looking at two a month, so it's probably two closer months, right, to okay. per year. So, and in terms of, um, in terms of just this year, did one last week, is there, has there been any pre that? In terms of this? No, um, so... Last year in November, we had one public inquiry and two detention hearings, um, and that was a good litmus test, obviously, for staff who had come in, maybe weren't, weren't, sh weren't sure about the procedures and so forth. Um, and then that was us driving forward to implement public inquiries at the start of this year. Um, unfortunately, that was further delayed, so um, we haven't had any. See, see, just roughly for ourselves, I understand, just on yep. that, because I want to ask about the MSIs as well, because okay. the figures that was quoted there, so you know. But see, just in general, the offences. In general, what would the offences be, and, and what's the worst in, in general now? So the worst in general would be the likes of very serious road traffic uh, MSIs. Um, you're talking about vehicles that are not roadworthy, or um, individuals that um, consistently breach the drivers' hours, for example. Um, if you have consistent breach of drivers' hours, you've then got potentially tired drivers on the roads. So that would be. <clears throat> more serious end. Um, some of these would be financial. Some of them would be questions over legal entity, where a partnership is actually publishing accounts under a limited company and so forth. And so, therefore, what the expectation would be is a correction to those details, as opposed to necessarily regulatory action coming out. I, and in terms of the, of the physical side of the vehicle stuff, it's it's classed as some of the minor stuff, is it? No, no. Um, you can have uh, serious, very serious, or most serious um, issues with regards to the vehicle itself. Now, obviously, if a vehicle is stopped on the roadside, um, it would be DVA would issue a prohibition notice so that uh, a vehicle with a serious defect isn't on the roads. No, 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 no. In the previous committee, because it's just when the chair mentioned, I mean, because um, the, the MSA is definitely, and I know that because we regulate, we we have the license. There's other operators out there, you know, registered somewhere else, doing the same things and. It happens within the taxi industry here as well, where you can, o you can only uh, regulate or go off those people who are part of the licence system. That's right. And, th and that's, that's where we get most of the complaints from the industry, to be fair. But, but just follow on just two points. In terms of anybody who wants to expand the business, um, I was dealing with one recently. Do you just need to go out on site, or is it a site visit? or? depends on the circumstances, is the honest answer. Um, and every case that's put forward is slightly different. What we could do is request DVA, DVA to do a compliance audit. It would be a site visit, um, not just to look at the actual physical makeup of the site, but to look at the papers, are you keeping the right records and are those records appropriate? And, and is that obviously is a difficulty through COVID to get that? Because I know I've, been, I've had a few phone calls in relation to that. Uh, I may come back to this in relation to that, but there are people still out there who, who definitely want to expand it. Yep. And just finally, in terms of obviously dealing with inquiries, <laughs> um, there's a review now to take place. I mean, clearly, you mentioned bar, barristers there, you mentioned judiciary. You just need to shore up the team or the resource issue. Or just... You want to preempt the, you know, the outcome of that. I mean, it'll, that'll become clear, I suppose. Is that I, I, if I was to say no? Well, it's just in, in respect to the seven. We obviously need to look at and, we need to look at the skill set. Yeah. There's no question. Yeah, and I mean, we're looking at how we access that. But yes, I just don't know what that what the outcome of that would be. Yeah, but you know, so okay. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Thank you, Mr. Beggs. <coughs> Again, thanks for your your presentation. Um, I have to say, very concerning the information you're reporting to us. Uh, just for clarity, you've had three hearings in 2000. And 19, and you've 70 awaiting uh, formal public hearings. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. And you normally expect two per month. Uh, yes. New cases to come in. New. That's correct. Yeah. So, what's your projection of when we'll be up to date? So, obviously, what we're looking to do is prioritise cases that are there. No, no, my question is, when will you be up to date so you will be well, able to address <laughs> things in a timely fashion? That depends on the, the continuing COVID crisis, so that has delayed If COVID, if COVID well, if was not restricting you... Our expectation would be six months. Six months. Our expectation would be six months. Okay. Six months. Um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, Sorry, but I'm trying to understand yeah, that, how did we get to this situation? I, I don't understand. How did we get to this situation? And you were meant to be regulating uh, all the operators so that there's not unfair competition from illegal operators and to allow illegal operators to expand where, where, where appropriate, and you haven't been doing it. You haven't been doing your job. Um, there has been a number of issues which have compounded this. So access to premises, access to skills. So yes, um, so it would be. How long have you lost your premises? Um, the premises were. 20, 20, 2018. 2018. Two years ago. 2018. Yeah. 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 So, you know, why do you not go out and rent something? Because the premises need to meet certain requirements, so they have to. Because the nature of this is where you have judicial type hearings, where you have to have a, a hearing. It takes two years to get suitable property. It has done. I, I find that quite unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of staffing, then, how long have you not had the skills in house to carry out the hearings to the right required standard? Well, the hearings have continued. Um, so the, because the the, uh, the issue has been that hearings have continued. There has been criticism from the upper tribunal about some of the processes. So that has not stopped hearings taking place, but, but it has. But you've recently the started to engage with deputy commissioners elsewhere. So. Prior to that, you didn't have staff with the required standard. Is that correct? Uh, we had well. The, it became clear from the feedback from the upper tribunal that there were issues that needed to be addressed as what far as skills issues? were concerned. What were the issues? It was the nature of the process. Yeah. So rather than um, the, rather than any of the findings, lack, lack of uh, adequate reason in an investigation within the hearing, um, the decision making process itself, and then uncertainty as to who the decision maker was. So it all falls around the issue of fairness within the hearing. And that's where we've then looked at the, uh, the judicial. It, is it reasonable to think if you had to go elsewhere, you didn't have the skills in, in house? Is that a reasonable assumption? Well, taking account of those criticisms, that was the that was the conclusion. Okay. Yeah. So my question is, how long have you not had the skills in house? Well, we haven't moved to having people with those skill set. With those particular skills, we haven't we haven't had those we haven't had those people. So the how long since when? Well, since uh, I mean, since the since legislation was brought in place, yeah. it was always run by and the decision making process sat by an administrative grid. Yeah. Um, so four years. No, you since, had since 2012. 2012. 2012. Yeah. It's always been. You've not time. had the skills. So and, I wouldn't say we haven't had the skills. I would. Yeah. There, what has happened is through the operate. So yes, there is a there's a skill deficit that we are now looking to address. But uh, the process has run. It has just been criticised by the fact that the skills. So yes, there has been a shortfall in skills. But I wouldn't say that we haven't had the skills. We haven't had all the skills. I think it's probably a, a fairer reflection. Um, and we we now that that's been identified to us from the upper tribunal. I would prefer be, if you're more frank. It's clearly been the criticism because decisions have not been appropriate, and you've had to go elsewhere. No, I, is that no, not correct? No, that's so, not correct. So there is a difference between the decisions being appropriate and the process. So the decisions themselves have not been subject to criticism. The process that got us there has been. So there is a difference. So um, just to be very clear, um, the the lack of skills has not stopped progress. It has been an issue that needs to be addressed as we try and make the thing as fair and robust as yeah. possible. What's been wrong with the process then? You said it's not the people, it's well, the process. It's, it's the issues that David outlined. Yeah, so uh, if you take a couple of the case examples that um, have led the criticism from the upper tribunal, the upper tribunal has um, not sought to overturn the decision of the department, mm -hmm. but has sought to criticise the decision making process and how we've got to that decision. So when looking at, for example, the backlog of, of 70, um, and a lot of these issues, fortunately, they're, they're gone back a number of years. So um, what we're looking to do is ensure that when we move forward, that we take a very, very clear and controlled step forward with regards to these hearings. What we certainly don't want to be doing is um, trying to rush through 70 hearings, get them out of the way quickly so that we're clear, um, but then be subject to a serious criticism from upper tribunal. So I haven't heard what was wrong with your process. Sorry, the process itself, nothing. Just within the actual decision making, within the hearing, yeah. um, it was so determined. Earlier on, you said there's nothing wrong with the decisions that, or the skills of the people. It yeah. was the process. And now you're saying it's not the process. I am no, confused. Sorry, the, 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 say the process. So when we went to a physical hearing, yeah. just as any judicial hearing, these are civil, civil, civil hearings. Um, the criticism from the opportunity tribunal has been around why the decision and determination yeah. so, was got to. So to, to sort of to clarify, just um, it, I find this so there there is a process. So there is a procedure which is set out, which is what we are referring to whenever we talk about the process. So there is a defined procedure 
which is what we were calling the process. So if so, th and that has not been subject to any criticism. That is that is uh, you know it just simply hasn't within that how the decisions were taken. So that has been that. So it is a, it's almost a subset of the operation within. So the process is fine, but the decision making within that has been the issue that has been subject to the criticism. I'm just, uh, just, uh, I'm, I'm more confused than when I started. I have to say, uh, Madam Chairperson, um, but uh, just in terms of the seriousness of this, um, as others have alluded to, some of the legal operators have been involved in people trafficking. Isn't that correct? Operating from Northern Ireland. And the, and the system has not worked here? They weren't licensed here? No. The, the, so any of the investigations that we've been made aware of, um, there's been no operators within Northern Ireland. Okay. Drivers from Northern Ireland then? Yeah. Um, I, yeah. yeah. Could there have been a regularly role in, in res, uh, improving this situation? So the drivers aren't regulated no, by um, ourselves? They, uh, well, I, I mean, the, the issue there is, um, so Probably, I mean, to be honest, the, the issue there probably is if somebody decides to um, act illegally and to in, indulge in, in these issues, we can we can identify a company which is acting in that way potentially. But if an individual driver decides to go out and, and engage in illegal practices and with the horrendous outcome that that had, I mean, this is. And are some had some companies been in dealing with illegal activity, whether it's that or other criminal activity, which none, you haven't been able to deal with? None that are licensed here. Yeah, so but it's the ones that are not licensed, are we able to well, certainly well, They're being dealt with in the jurisdiction where they are licensed, so that's the Kent Police. That, that particular case that particular is with one? the Essex Police. Um, Essex. So the, the other operators, I mean, there's been a few ones recently um, of uh, drugs within Dover, and that was linked to a driver in Northern Ireland and so forth. We engage with the authorities to find out if there's anything that the department needs to be aware of. Have we an operator, licensed operator, linked to this? Um, quite often, where it's an NCA involvement, sorry, National Crime Agency involvement, um, with ongoing investigations, they'll give us very little. Um, local PSNI would make us aware as to whether or not there's anything we need to be aware of. Um, and in the most, in all those recent examples uh, over the last few months, there's been nothing linked to other licensed operators. We don't have concerns that there are any bits of process that aren't being operated by us that would have stopped these these issues. That I think, um, because if there were, as a human being, you would. A, a final, final question. Then you've indicated that virtual meetings can occur, and that will help you deal with the backlog. That only occurs when both parties agree to it. So if you're potentially taking action against someone, presumably they're not agreeing to it. So are all the illegal operations uh, or areas where you have concern really not being addressed by the virtual system and when will they be addressed by public hearings? Yep, so what, what, we've, what we've done is we've established not only the process for the virtual hearings but we've established then the mechanisms to facilitate in the current times a face-to-face -face hearing and we've got presiding officers happy and content to come across. Um, we've got location for that and we've engaged with PSNI and we've engaged with the LPS to make sure that we're meeting all the, the regulations. Um, what we are going to do is engage with the Traffic Commissioner about their lessons learned. Um, there is an opportunity potentially to um, work with operators um, where we have a serious road safety concern. There is an opportunity um, to, um, to disqualify until they can make themselves available at a hearing. Um, one final question. Given the backlog and given the, the work that's ongoing, can we justify having our own trained commissioner ourselves so that everything will happen on a timely basis going forward? And what's the comparable cost of, of subcontracting this in? That would be a matter for the review. Your view is? My, my, that, was, sorry, that would be a matter for the review. Okay. Right, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm mindful we need to be out of here by one o'clock, but we have three. Um, the other members wish to ask okay. questions, so we'll have Ms Anderson and followed by Mr Muir and then Mrs Kelly. Okay. Thank you, thank okay. you for the uh, the presentation and um, I can understand Mr Beggs's frustration uh, because I think none of us realised that the skills shortage went back eight years. Is that what I picked up from 2012? No, I think... It's always been set out within the, um, the policy and the practice that it's been an administrative uh, function to, to preside over these hearings. And I think the lesson learned over time was that um, the procedure 
within a hearing to give fair open hearings um, is very much a judicial one. The criticism from the upper tribunal is also there to show um, or to support that, that, that thought. So there has been then over the last while a mechanism put in place to try and identify how we best then take forward these hearings in a manner that ensures that they're fair, open, meet all the requirements, um, reducing the opportunity then for, for appeal. Now, an individual has a right to appeal, and that will include an appeal that the department's decision is ultimately wrong, but really an appeal would be around whether or not they got the opportunity for fair hearing. Um, engagement with somebody that's trained as a barrister judiciary um, strengthens the department, I suppose, in that regard. I think all that goes without saying, but uh, I was just listening to the response that was that was given earlier about 2012, and here we are in 2020. So um, I know that the chair had asked about the skill shortage, but I think that was further information that you got about that. How do you have a fair, open, transparent manner when you don't have a, a premise from 2018? Where do you operate from? So we were using premises um, belonging to other departments. Uh, we had been using um, Cleaver House, Clarence Court for non-public inquiries, and Kelly Meal House. Um, unfortunately, their access to those, um, obviously first and foremost for their own departments, and as their own business ramped up, our availability suffered. As a how close are you to getting or securing a premise? So we've, on a short-term front, we've now agreed with the LPS, a site in Belfast, um, for hearings on a fairly regular basis, um, and then they're now taking forward uh, the long-term view. Uh, security assessment, the Clarence Court's determined that <clears throat> that it's not suitable. Um, so we have to we we'll have to look elsewhere. Uh, you're responsible for licensing and regulation of the heavy goods vehicle yep. operators. Uh, do you anticipate the role is going to change due to Brexit? No, uh, the regulation aspect, um, we will regulate based upon how an operator conforms to the law. As the law changes, the expectation would be that they would then conform to the, conform to the new law. Um, really, if we get referrals, regardless of what the infringement is, whether that's against the law or otherwise, we'll take action against that. So do you know what drivers need to do uh, to drive professionally in the EU if there's a crash out Brexit? That's, would be, uh, that's a driver like that. To be honest, until we know more clearly about what the outcome would be, I, I don't know. Is there any interrogation of that? Because I know that Holliers and others are very deeply concerned about the fact that they don't understand in a few weeks' time what they may have to do to drive professionally uh, in the EU. Yeah. So, is there any understanding being shared with them about what they may have to do? That's a matter for that. I mean, that's a matter that's going to going to be an outworking in the negotiations. So, um, just say there's a crash out. What do you do to inform Holliers of what they need to do? Well, we would need to see what they what we would need to see exactly what the what a crash out looked like. So, um, at this so point, say if there was a crash out. There may be a few weeks between, for instance, a crash out and Holliers receiving that information. A few months, longer. No, all you need to know. Yeah. In order from a transport regulation perspective, um, we wouldn't be involved in policy or legislation. It's more than about how we um, take action against non-compliant operators, regardless of what the laws are at the time. But how can they be non-compliant if they don't know what it is? Like we know the British government hasn't put a focus on the transport sector. Uh, they, um, I mean, the outworkings. Uh, one of the issues about transport in general is, of course, that it's you know they, they by their nature they they move. Um, so I mean, this is one which actually the impact of it will be. It'll depend on really what the UK government you know agrees or, or whatever. It's to be honest, I don't know. You don't know. Um, is no. the, and Holliers don't know either. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. And um, a number of my questions have already been dealt with, particularly by Mr. Beggs. I think the, the backlog is an issue of concern. Um, it's an issue with lots of uh, hauliers who have made contact with me around that, particularly as a result of the stress that they're under as a result of COVID-19, and then also the worries around Brexit, which is Mrs. Anderson has touched upon. I think it's really important that that backlog is addressed. And one more question is that since this pandemic started, all of us have been able to adapt to online communications. Mrs Kelly's on online. We've all understood what Zoom is. Why was there such a delay in convening those hearings online? I understand that 
you have to get the, the permission from the, part the different parties to do it. But why was there such a delay in being able to convene that? We as MLAs and constituents were able to get online within days to do our business, but it seems to be there's been a significant delay around that. I think that's because of the nature of the, the process that we need to go through. Yeah, which... we've obviously sought advice um, throughout and we've kept an eye on the advice both from the local court service and from the Office of the Traffic Commissioner. Um, they've um, moved forward very carefully in, in GB and I'm very conscious of the fact that with the concerns and issues we had around face-to-face -face hearings, it was a greater leap to move into the virtual hearing mm. concerns that that brought. And certainly with the Office of the Traffic Commissioner, who um, if they've got those concerns, then we need to take, take pay attention to those, I suppose. I understand that, but courts were able to meet virtually, and there's allowed to be virtual engagement around, in terms of particularly in terms of prisoners from uh, and taking evidence and all sorts of stuff. So there was there was d deliberate effort made to be able to convene online hearings, and it just I'm not leaving here with an impression that there's a real urgency in terms of dealing with these situations and that's my concern around that and I say that with you know genuine concern that there's a backlog here holiers are facing real real financial strain and we really need to be reassured that there's concerted efforts to be able to turn this around well I can assure you there has been every concerted effort what we're conscious of is the fact that the consequences of hearings are actually very serious they have very serious implications for road safety. They also have very serious implications for whether we are actually supporting our industry to be to be fair. The process that we need to go through to ensure that that is, is, is outworked has to be absolutely watertight. Because if we go through a process that actually has any question about the, the fairness or the validity of it, then that is an issue. We also needed to get the casework ready. So I can assure you that while I much would have preferred things had happened quicker than this, um, they have happened as quickly as we as we can as we can make them happen. Thank you. I think, Chair, it's been important a number of months' time to review where how we've progressed in relation to this. So I've got to worry that this is going to run and run. So. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Kelly. Thanks, Chair. I'm trying to be brief. I'm just picking up on Mr. Fed. Uh, Colin being involved in illegal activity, the people trafficking and illegal waste. I, I think that anyone who's interested and human rights and, and trying to close down those who would traffic in people would want all of the statutory agencies to bring their full might down upon those who would be guilty. So I just wonder then, um, what assurances can you give to the public uh, that you will do all in your power, whether the drivers or haulage companies are licensed here or elsewhere, to put these people out of business? risk assessment that took place whenever we were identifying the information that's made available to us. So what is what we are aware of, we prioritise so and we look we look at the issues that are set out, you know, safety issues and, and that. So I mean if there was a, an immediate concern we um you know, about a particular operator acting illegally, that would become probably a police matter. Yeah, first and foremost the police matter yeah. and then the conviction would be an instant yeah. loss of repute and that's the point in time where they would lose their licence, absolutely. So we're not privy to information that would cause any concern for people trafficking or drug smuggling or illegal waste that we're sitting on. I, I can assure you of that and as it becomes aware of us, we made aware as regulators, we have a regulation rule, we don't have that enforcement rule. But, but just, sorry Chair, just to say that um, the, the, the haulage company had more than one lorry and one of them was found to be used in criminal activity. Would that then mean there would be a concerted effort by the uh, agency or the department to assure that across all of its um, um, uh, other bits of its department to uh, inspect the vehicles and drivers that are working for or are driving uh, for the company that has been found to be in breach, if that makes sense? Yeah, so, um, the the breach there would essentially be by the operator, as opposed to just one driver, per se. Now, obviously, there would be due process to find out what knowledge was had and so forth. But again, the regulation here is on the operator and the expectation that they train drivers and they manage drivers. Um, that's that's so where we would look at for the regulatory action. That would have an impact on the repute, obviously. So I mean, it's one of the one of the criteria that they're required to, to meet is to be of good repute, and if something like that happened, that immediately raises a concern about their repute. So that would be, and in an instance where that that would be prioritised as a something like that, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. we'd absolutely. I don't think we've had that. 
particularly? No, I don't believe so. No, no. no but it would obviously that would that would send a red flag, and it would. And there are the mechanisms through whereby the impact on the repute is something that we, as as you know, the the li uh, licensing could could pick up. Uh, well, I don't think that's my experience. I do know of some hauliers who have been fined, particularly for illegal dumping, and I know they're still in business. So I don't know how that has happened. But we'll come back to that maybe at another point. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much for coming this morning. Sure, sure, just I think a quick point. Very, very quickly, as, as, because it's, it's an yeah. important point. Because on the EU statute, see in terms of the um, OCS infringement. Yes. There's an assessment process in terms that's, of the operator. And that's the so, yeah. and that's something. You know, that's, I know Ms. Anderson was asked about that. We need to be clear on on all of that. You know I mean? Sorry. Yeah. So, where you have an MSI, it is essentially loss of repute. But the EU regs say that you have to then undertake a, an administrative process to determine whether putting someone out of business then is proportionate to the offence. Um, but that's all the sort of case work, and that's why we need to be so careful when we're in a public inquiry to make sure that all of that is measured up and weighed up. Okay, so thank you again for, for coming um, this morning. Um, I, I think members probably, rather than having been more reassured, we probably have um, more concerns, but um, I think we will return to this probably um, in the next um, number of weeks. Um, but again, thank you for coming this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think probably just on that, you know, that was that was quite astounding. Um, I think we need to write to the minister just to raise our concerns in relation to this. I think every member has a concern with regards to um, yeah. what's happening here. Um, there isn't any aspect of this business which um, gives us any sort of cause for <coughs> comfort. So, um, I don't know if the members have any issues. Mrs. Kelly, you, you yeah, just just nodding. Well, I, I noted what Cahill said there about putting someone out of business is proportionate, and that's always a measure, I suppose, you know. But uh, I, I just have concerns that, uh, that that there are people who are, are disreputable are still operating, and we just don't seem to be able to get to, to grips with them. I just wonder how the information is shared around the regulatory bodies to uh, actually make the penalty fit the crime in some respects. No, Chair, I was only making the point. But I agree with Dolores. I mean, you know, some of the figures there is astounding. Some of the stuff, the information we got today, so something the committee definitely needs to follow up on. You know, so. Mr. Beggs. Yeah. Uh, I have to say that was the most confusing bit of evidence sure. I've ever ever received. Uh, it wasn't the people. It wasn't the process. But nobody can explain what caused the problem. I think we need to delve further. Um, perhaps try and get an explanation in writing because they weren't getting a verbal explanation yeah. of how things got out of control. Um, I have got a sense that the the where both parties agree to hold hearings, the, the virtual hearings, there's a capability of dealing with the backlog. I have no understanding of how illegal operators who will not probably agree to hearings will be addressed. So uh, we need to have confidence uh, when those types of hearings uh, will will resume, COVID permitting, of course. Uh, but uh, the, you know, we we I didn't hear that at all there. 23rd of November and virtual will be on the 14th of December. Okay, okay. So but, you, the, but the scale in which yeah. they're happening. Yeah. If you're content that um, committee staff again review um, the recording um, and to encapsulate the concerns um, articulated by members, and we write to the minister. Write to the minister. The minister. I think the minister needs to be made aware of this. Absolutely. Um, I think there's sort of a leadership problem in the whole section, to be honest. Okay, so if you're content, I'm mindful of our time. So, um, with regards to forward work programme, you'll find it at page 293, and that takes us to the 18th of November. If you're content, yep. um, any other business? No? Okay, thank you. The date of the next meeting will be Wednesday, the 4th of November, um, in the Senate Chamber, Corn Buildings, at 10 um, a.m. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Okay. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed.